Soma Union. Let me tell you, I don't get excited for, well, anything, but I was excited for this game. Maybe it's not the best to get your hopes up for a game, but this is a Torch 60 game, so I actually couldn't see it being bad. So yeah, T60's latest game. In case if you're unaware, I've basically looked at all of Torch 60's previous public work, and let me tell you, those are some fun games. All with their own taste to them, but still retaining that distinct Torch 60 look and sound. And talk about a good time to jump in, too. Being told about Soma Union being worked on after I finished my Soma Spirits video. I believe development of it was started sometime back in 2019, which only around two years and some change is very impressive, especially considering how much of a banger this game is. But there's something I want to talk about first. Can we just get this over with? Okay, before we go forward with this review, I think I need to address the past that has been haunting me. And I know what you're thinking, Spacey, why did you write something so corny in the script? But now's not the time for the foolin' and the coolin'. For you snoozers unaware, Soma Union is the sequel to one of Torch 60's previous games that I've looked at, Soma Spirits. Still an incredible game. It's just a shame that I can't really stand my original review for it. It really hits me wrong and I need to rectify it. Because due to recent understandings with myself, I kind of see Soma Spirits differently. And I suppose I can see it a lot more with how Sergeant M, the lead developer for most Torch 60 games, saw it. In which case, it really makes me view the characters in Soma Spirits alongside characters that appear in other games by Torch 60 in a different light that I appreciate a lot more. What I'm trying to say is that I'm bipolar. Come on, people, pay attention. Are you even taking notes? Let me check that notepad real quick. Anyways. You may even be able to tell what phase I'm going through right now, even though I'm pretty good at hiding it, baby. But that's not the point. Which neither one in particular is a good or a bad thing, because there's nothing wrong with both sides of me. You have to love the both sides, you know? That's kind of what Soma Spirits was about, right? I mean, I think it was, I don't know. But, you know, whatever. It's why sometimes in my videos I sound really tired or super energized. People ask stuff like, Hey Spacey, you sound really tired or sad this video, are you okay? And it's like, Nah, no, that's just me being depressive, come on. And no, I'm not okay. But <laughs> I know this seems pretty out of the blue, but it's something that has been building up for a long time. But I thought it was normal. I don't talk to other people. I don't know how they act, you know? However, I am pretty certain about this aspect of myself, and I mean that. I guess this also sounds so weird coming from the Soma Spirits video and what I said there, and that's still true. But I guess it also means that my Soma Spirits video is a little bunky now. I think what I have to say about Soma Spirits is a lot different nowadays, and I appreciate the fact that I'm understanding myself now after playing it, because now I really like the message behind it, and somehow I have ended up loving these two dudes even more. Like, I already love their designs, their character, everything, but now I can really relate to the unique idea they represent about loving all parts of yourself, but I don't know, maybe being manic depressive shouldn't be treated as a part of yourself. I'm still thinking about it all. But yeah, I just wanted to say this to get some closure on that video, and this time I mean it, because this is like the third time I've brought this game up to correct myself. Like, dang it, Spacey, you gotta put this one to rest. And I think I have. Truly the final boss of videos I've done. And you may be thinking this isn't a terrible time to bring it up, as Soma Union is the sequel to Soma Spirits, so why not bring it up? But you don't necessarily need to play Soma Spirits to play Soma Union. Because Soma Union takes place over a hundred years after the events of Soma Spirits, the game begins with our hero named Zero, staring off into space from the ship that they're on. They're looking out for a piece of their broken world, Soma. Yes, the planet of Soma has been destroyed, one calamity after another. This planet has it rough. And we learn that Zero and everyone else aboard their ship have spent the last 20 years trying to find any piece of Soma, to no success. We learn of the world's destruction from a mysterious light one day appearing in the sky summoning monsters and eventually fracturing the planet. Exploring the ship and talking to the other people of the crew, it seems like today is like any other, until Zero and their friends get attacked in the ship's garden by these monsters that may be related to the ones that spawned in the Calamity. And right after that, the group spots out in the distance a floating landform, a piece of Soma. And it's due to the exploration of these pieces of Soma that the group goes on a journey to restore their destroyed planet. Yeah, imagine that. Instead of saving the world, here, the world already got destroyed, and now we gotta put it back together. Zero is of course not alone on their journey as they travel alongside their aforementioned friends, Lumen the Doctor and Rekka the Acorn. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's what she's listed as. Doctors, Spirits, and a gosh darn acorn. 
Don't sleep though, acorns are actually kind of important in this world. But alongside this, they're also supported by their crew on the spaceship, which is basically a hub area where you can go back, chill, shop, and overall- Oh snap! Is that Minister Orange? From Crescent Prism? Hey, hey man, what's up? Your world got destroyed? Yeah, sure as hell it did. I said earlier that this game doesn't require past knowledge of previous Torch 60 games, but it honestly hits so differently if you played the past Torch 60 games, it's like a reward, that I definitely recommend doing so before playing this one. Though it would be interesting to get one's opinion on Soma Spirits after playing Soma Union, but I feel like it just wouldn't be as fun. One thing you appreciate and notice after playing all these games is just the style of it. I'm talking about the music, the graphics, the writing. There's just such a unique set of developer Sergeant M's art and composer Agent Ape's music that makes these games stand out, and I've honestly grown to love it so much. Sergeant M's character design is so good. I think I've said this in the Crescent Prison video, but I am legit surrounded by good character design, at least the kind of stuff that I'm into. I could give an award to basically every enemy you encounter in this game. I love all of their designs so much, I can't even point towards a specific one. It's one of my favorite kind of worlds, where anything really flies in terms of what the characters look like, and habitats that come in all shapes and sizes. Also much like Crescent Prism, I kinda went wild when I opened up the menu for the first time, this UI is clean! And the battle screen too, I was amazed when I saw this, it looks great. Everything is just so vibrant and colorful, and the animated backgrounds once again look so good, with a ton of different ones for all the different encounters. Some of the footage might look a little laggy, as my crappy computer struggled a bit during encounters due to these animated battle backgrounds, but luckily they can be turned off for potatoes like me, which I probably would have done if I wasn't recording for a video, because I want to show you all the cool backgrounds. But yeah, even like 4 games in, I'm still impressed with how nice these menus are, not even to mention that every character has portraits, with most having different emotions, that's great. Let's also not forget the cutscene pictures and the areas themselves. Hell, even the walking sprite sets feel more bouncier and livelier than the previous games, but I might just be wild in on that one. There's just a bar of consistency set here with this game's charming art style that I find so impressive, and I think maintaining quality all around like that is not easy. And yeah, I know what you're thinking, I always do. Spacey, why are you being so positive? Where is the negativity, aren't you a reviewer? And well, here's the negativity, it's you, now leave. But you know what, maybe you're right. I should calm down. But then I remember I haven't even talked about the music yet. The soundtrack as usual was composed by Agent Ape, who I'd consider to be the other half of Torch 60's two person crew. I mean hey, it's even said in the credits, this game wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Agent Ape. And I'm not sure if this is referencing the fact that Agent Ape is a pretty dope programmer, or the fact that his music really is just that important. His music is so unique, and I've really tied his music to this art style. I like the story it tells too, this game really feels like the sequel to Soma Spirits, with several songs referencing Soma Spirits, it's really cool. I also love how the boss theme syncs up to the encounters, it gets me pumped every time. There's a few standout tracks for me, most of them are spoilers though, so I'll talk about them when we get to my full playthrough, but I do gotta give a shout out to Alpha's battle theme. It was what you heard in the opening of this video, love that song. I guess I'm kinda sad I can't say more about the music, because making music is hard to do, and can take a bit, but I'm, I mean dang, just go and listen to it, yeah? Agent Ape has the soundtrack up on his band camp, alongside his other work, even including stuff not featured in Torch 60 games, I've given it all a listen. There's some pretty heavy jammers, and some projects I'm pretty curious on, but that is neither here nor there, but what is there is the link to all this in the description below. Okay, so before we get into dear lord what might be my longest gameplay analysis yet, I want to talk about one last thing, the writing. I've always enjoyed Torch 60's writing, the way a lot of characters talk and such, it feels very genuine, but excuse my language. I'm going to use the Q word here. I know, I know, I never say any bad words, but here it is. I've seen people call this game quirky, 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 and I mean, I don't know. That word has definitely lost all meaning to the point where I can't even say people are using it wrong. 
But when I think of quirky games, I typically think of ones with a lol random sense of humor. Games where I feel like a sign is being held up telling me, laugh now please. And trust me, I've looked at quite a number of games with quirky humor, and every time I say I'm not a fan of it. Which is why I don't think Soma Union fits that description, because this game consistently made me laugh. Jokes actually had set up and were sometimes clever enough that I didn't even immediately catch them. Like the joke about the strawberry character eating food with the strawberries in it. I remember reading through that text casually and then like one second later I was like, oh wait, that was good. And that's what I mean when I say that there's setup. Not only has the strawberry character been here throughout the entire game, but there is a separate story reason for why there is food there to begin with, and I don't know. I just think that's clever, and it just makes things feel a lot less forced. Let me tell you, doing good humor in these games is hard, but I could tell I really vibed with Sergeant M's sense of humor when I was using the scan command on enemies just to get a laugh out of their descriptions. At the end of the day, humor is subjective. Clearly people love the little random stuff, and those people probably don't watch my videos if I'm gonna be honest. But I like the writing here, and maybe just writing the game off as quirky kinda undermines some of the effort here. But I guess on the other hand, who the hell cares whether or not something is under an artificial labor tort category? Because as long as I'm having fun, I don't care. And talking about having fun, I think it's time we get to the gameplay. And wowie do I have a lot to say about this game's gameplay. I guess I'll start where the game starts. With the difficulty selection screen, always cool to see games have these. I also love how this all looks visually. Once again, I love this game's user interface. I went with hard mode of course, as I've been proven beforehand that Torch 60 knows how to make a game that's hard and fun. I'm not going to tell you what difficulty you should choose, but I had a blast with hard mode. But I can understand if you're not about nearly every enemy attack having or taking 75% of your HP. End of the day, the point of difficulty selection is to choose the version of the game you'll have the most fun with. And this is definitely what I want. Let's start with overworld exploration, because there's some pretty neat stuff here. Encounters in this game are random once again, which actually makes Soma Spheres a pretty interesting outlier as it's the only Torch 60 game with on-screen encounters. Though there are moments where there are on-screen enemies, mostly in the form of an obstacle to avoid. But like the other Torch 60 games, there is a way to skip fights. I'll talk about that later though. A pretty good majority of this game takes place exploring dungeons. There's some cool puzzles to be expected, once again serving to make each dungeon unique from one another. But I was surprised at the focus of obstacles you have to use timing to avoid. I remember something similar to this in a post-game dungeon in Brave Hill Yusha, and I'm glad to see it expanded on. In some ways it's hard to explain, but seeing all these obstacles moving around and having to avoid them using real timing just makes the world feel a lot more alive. Some notable things include these moments where you have to collect several keys on a large screen in order to move on. I always found these to be pretty fun. Dungeons also typically have a sort of collectible to scout for, like you'll find an NPC asking for several or something you go around and search for, which helps with exploration. And in fact, dungeons have a lot of different things for the players to collect. For example, these colored orbs here. Walking on them automatically uses them. Green ones refill a percentage of your party's HP, blue for MP. There's these purple ones too, but I'll get to them later, so calm down and take a seat. Even though I find these orbs to be pretty pointless with how little they heal, although it can be upgraded, I find the sensation of picking them out to be oddly addicting. It's that Pac-Man kind of dopamine rush of just collecting these boba balls in a row. Mix this with the previously mentioned collectibles, treasure chests, and the power gems which I'll get to later. Makes for the kind of experience where there's almost always something catching your attention in a dungeon. Something is always happening. My mind is always focusing on the game because I'll find a chest or see some orbs or hey, there's a puzzle, you know? There's always something on screen. And you're planning out your destination as these collectibles constantly force you to engage with the game by making sure you go and get them. It makes the dungeon exploring experience very smooth and engaging. But then, you get hit with the random encounter. I will say that there is a setting turned on by default in the options that make it so the longer you're on a screen, the less random encounters you get. And I'm not sure if this means the more steps you take or the actual time you're on the screen because I honestly couldn't tell if this was working or not. But I guess that's also kind of the point. It's not something you notice, but you still kind of feel. But I guess on the other side of the boba ball, there aren't too many screens you're on long enough to get more than like 3 encounters anyways. Now for actual battles though. Much like Brave Hero Yusha, we've got 3 party members max, with our trio being Zero, Rekka, and Lumen. I mean, Sergeant M could probably make a one person party fun at this point. The major system of Soma Union is that of roles. 
characters can switch between support and power roles. This can be done in the menu outside of battle, but also in battle, where upon using an action and a new role, you can't switch roles again for a turn. Depending on what role you are currently in, affects what skills you can use, very much so like the support and power skill sets of Soma Spirits. The power role is where you attack and deal damage. One thing really neat is about how this game handles normal attacks, selecting attacks brings up a skill menu, and here you'll notice that both your magic skills and your standard physical attack skill are free. And I think this is really interesting because you always have access to some form of magic and physical attack at the cost of no MP, and it makes this form actually pretty nice for saving on MP. Because when you go to support, ooh, under the support role, you'll be assisting your other party members. As you would imagine, this would mean healing and such, but what you wouldn't imagine is everything else that it implies. So when Union could have been simple about it, just heals, stat raisers, that's it. But much like the game it's a sequel of, there is a major focus on synergy. Using skills that affect other party members by giving them new skills or altering existing skills. For example, using a skill that not only gives a party member a large physical attack bonus for this turn, but also changes the element of that physical attack to one that the supporter specializes in. Like, Rekka is the only one who can use fire and earth magic, but she can give another party member the ability to use these elements in the form of a physical attack at that. Another example being using a skill to give a buff to a party member that upgrades their magic spells to be stronger, but they now cost MP, which is neat because these upgraded magic skills are typically the spells that you would learn from leveling up in other games, you know? Like here's a stronger version of a pre-existing skill, now you'll never use the previous skill. But Sumo Union does really well in not doing that. Like the cure spell you have at the beginning of the game is the same one you'll be using at the end. It's still just as powerful. And this may all sound complicated, but luckily characters kind of share the same idea of skills. For example, Zero has ice and wind magic, Rekka has fire and earth, and Lumen has water and electric. Zero has a skill that powers up another party member's magic attack and makes it give a certain status effect. Rekka and Lumen have identical skills, just giving a different status effect. All party members have a cure spell and a spell that amps another member's magic. What this creates is an extremely and unique fun team dynamic. You know how other RPGs have like these united attacks, you know the team up double techs and that? Well this game is infinitely cooler because you get to make your own team attacks. I could do things like having party member B give party member C a huge damage boost while party member A upgrades C's magic to give all enemies a status effect. This is way more gratifying than pressing a simple button and watching an animation play while you think about how you just wasted two characters turns in one. And there are also so many factors to experiment with too, creating a variety of plays that make you feel smart. Utilizing all these team mechanics really make it feel like you're playing a different game. The coolest part of this all though is how it contributes to the idea of this being a sequel to Soma Spirits. In Soma Spirits, you had one party member supporting the other one, while they were in like a power role. In that game, you only had two party members, but here you have three, and there are more skills that synergize more, and the ability for these characters to switch between these roles during combat. It's so cool to see an expansion to an already brilliant idea, making it even funner and interesting. Like, coming from Soma Spirits, I didn't think this idea could be expanded upon, but leave it up to Sergeant M to find a way to twist it in a way that makes it not only unique to itself, being different enough from Soma Spirits for both of them to stand on their own, but also still being an evolution of ideas from Soma Spirits. And I don't know about you, but that's pretty awesome. This game is also very smart with making sure you don't stick to one strategy. You will nearly always have one or more characters in the support role, but who that is always changes off situations, it's very dynamic. For example, you can be slapping it up with Rekka while Lumen and Zero buff and keep the heals up, but it'll snap. Rekka just got hit by an attack down debuff, we should switch her to support, she's kinda useless. Or oh no, the enemy I just scanned is weak to fire or earth magic, but has a ton of magic defense. So Rekka casting these spells won't do nearly as much damage as Rekka going into support and giving another character fire or earth elemental attributes to their physical attacks. Another thing to help with keeping every fight interesting is the outside factors too. As I said before, the basic normal attacks don't cost MP, but most of your options in the support role do cost MP. So if your supports are running low on MP from multiple encounters through a dungeon, it may be time to switch the character's roles around. But there are power skills that cost MP too, and you may want to switch your power characters to support if you feel like you want to regain some MP. And I know what you're thinking, Spacey, that doesn't make any sense. 
How does switching to support help a character regain MP? Support role is where MP goes to die, Spacey. I used to have MP, Spacey, but then I became support. Well, calm down. That's because I haven't told you how defending in this game works. Unlike most RPGs, you actually have a reason to use the defend skill, as it also heals you, which I feel like is one of those things that every RPG should have, that I hear people say more RPGs should have, yet in the end I see very few games utilize. Back to the point, while you heal HP by defending in power mode, you restore MP if you defend in support mode. This, alongside the blue spheres, no, not, not those ones, yeah, these ones, help you restore MP without having to use an MP recovering item, because if you're unaware, this is a JRPG economy, and what that means is that items that restore MP cost like 10 times more than anything else at stores. You may think with all I've said so far, that a problem arises with Soma Union where the characters being so similar kind of homogenizes them to the point of being boring, but that's also called being incorrect. Don't speak up again or you're out of here, got it? Characters do differ from each other, due to equipment. 5 equipment slots? Not bad, but it's what you do with them that counts. The last two are a little more special than your typical equipment that you're used to. So, in execution upon the terms of expectation to that of how equipment normally behaves, there's more like three equipment slots, which sounds reminiscent of Soma Spirits, and you might be thinking I'm crying and shaking in a corner at the sound of that. But this game and Torch 60 games in general have really changed my viewpoint on a lot of game design things when it comes to classic RPGs, and maybe I've just become a little more mature. Every character has two different weapon types that they specialize in. Zero has spears and rods, Rekka has hammers and swords, Lumen has knives and books, and I have a YouTube account in no life. There's a choice to be made with what weapon type you want a character to have, both in terms of the stats that they give, but how they change your default physical attack in battle. While rods, hammers, and knives work as the standard physical attack we're used to, the others have interesting modifiers. Zero's spears only deal 80% damage, but have a 30% chance of striking twice, which in case you aren't taking notes, is 160% damage. Youch! Rekka swords have a fun damage range between 80 and 120%, meaning you can deal 20% more or less damage. Finally, Lumen's books only deal 80% damage, but have an HP drain effect. I am so glad that Sergeant M put these percentages here. Call me wild, but I actually like it when games don't hide information from me. Also, shoutouts again for using those icons to tell players when a skill is physical or magical. Back on topic though, I actually really love Lumen's books. Because while it seems like it's just a weak attack with a crappy HP drain, don't forget you can give him a single turn mega buff to his normal physical attack, also giving it an element. If you do this with the book, while giving Lumen an elemental attribute the enemy is weak to, not only do you do a lot of damage, but you basically get a full heal for Lumen while you're at it, it's so satisfying. But typical of this game's fashion, you randomly find the next tier of equipment in dungeons and it may not be the one that you always prefer. Which even though I love Lumen's books, if the dungeon gives me his next tier knife, then yeah sure, let's give it a spin, I'll swap out. Because they don't just affect your attacks, different equipment specialize in different stats too. You want Zero to be more magic based? Pull out the spear. You want them to be balanced? Get out that rod. Moving on, armors are mostly just deciding if you feel like having more physical or magical defense that day. But then we get to rings, which is the variety fun slot you'd expect. This and the next two slots is where characters really begin to stand out from each other. Everyone can equip any ring, which can do a variety of things from resisting elements, increasing stats like speed, which knowing your character's speed can be pretty vital when it comes to heals, to these rings also doing things like giving regen, buffing your cure spell, resisting certain status effects, giving you a 2% crit rate, wow, imagine spending money to buy something as silly as a 2% crit chance, who would do that? Oh yeah baby, it's crit time! And what's cool is that your free magic skills I mentioned earlier can crit too, which is pretty awesome. And if that was enough, there's also special equipment that you can get such as armor or weapons that can be equipped by anyone, and these equipment have interesting side effects. You can find them by exploring and obtaining toy schematics that you can bring back to the ship. One of the many things to encourage you to go back to the ship to do, which I like, it gets you excited. The ship has a toy shop where these schematics can be turned into what I like to call gimmick gear. These items have interesting secondary functions that make them stand out from the normal equipment you get, 
but I personally couldn't find a time where I was actually interested in using them. And maybe that's just because of the stats they give, or more like didn't give. But there's probably some cool things you can do with these. I see some plays with the spring punch. By now you're probably wondering, I said there were 5 equipment slots, so what about the last two? Well, here's where things get a bit wild. Just a little moderate, so watch out, because I'm coming. Both these equipment slots share the same kind of equipment type, sigils. Much like rings, they can be equipped by everybody. They don't give any stat ups, but instead they give new skills and passives. Back into battles, there's a parameter known as SP, spirit points. Much like its first appearance in Soma Spirits, it increases by one every turn. The skills given by these sigils cost SP, with more powerful skills costing more. What's neat about this is that these skills can be used in any role, which means it's actually possible to attack in support mode, and you can also heal in attack mode. This creates a massive hole of decision making and ideas, both on which character should have what, and when they should use it. It gives a nice buff to support due to allowing you to both attack and support, vice versa, but of course, you can't do both in one turn. Knowing which sigils to use even in the moment is strategy on its own. Some of these ones with the longer SP cost can end up being pretty useless on random encounters, but can be very powerful on boss fights which are naturally longer. Luckily, this is a good video game, and it actually warns you when a boss is coming up, just like in Crescent Prism. I mean, to be fair, a save and a full heal usually gets the job done in telling you, but the certainty is nice. It also manages to avoid cheese while still being free form. Defending doesn't build SP, which encourages the player to be active and not play like a total pop tart waiting to use a strong SP attack. I actually went back and checked and as it turns out, yeah, in previous games you still got SP from blocking. I wasn't even aware of this until Summon Union brought it up because I'm gonna be honest, that's a really boring way to play the game. But I ain't judging. Hell, I did a little poison stalling myself this playthrough. I guess that makes me a bit of a hypocrite, but listen, there's a difference between playing like a pop tart and playing like a hot pocket, and until you know the difference, you don't stand a chance against me. So with all these different abilities, the sigils, and the characters in general, I can say that I don't see the characters as the same. If anything, it kind of feels like you're controlling six different characters, and at points I did find myself planning out to use a skill only to remember I wasn't on the right role, and even character skills can differ a little bit based off their stats. By that I mean the likes of the healing spell, I had zero as my support more often than not, and they are pretty slow, which means they typically healed at the end of everyone's turn. Meanwhile if I healed with someone fast like Lumen, it would happen at the start of the turn. Maybe I'm just a big old nerd, but I think there is a major difference between the pros and the cons of these two forms of healing. And the fact that throughout the game I had a very keen memory on the characters battle speeds probably goes to show the importance and how much I thought about them during combat. Like, last hitting with zero while your other party members defended to regen was kinda risky, unless if you checked the enemy's agility stat to make sure that your slowest party member could outspeed them. Overall, we have a combat system based around a major mechanic, which creates a very unique and freeform kind of battle system, where it's based more on reacting to the current situation rather than repeating the same strategy every fight. I honestly haven't even touched on a lot of the skills and the synergies caused with them, for example Magic Amp. Magic Amp is that support skill I was talking about used to upgrade another party member's magic skills. This buff goes away after a few turns, and using multiple ma magic amps farther upgrades the magic skill. So that's cool, a neat little interaction. But things go a step farther because in the power roll, you can use Amp Charge, which lets you consume those magic amp buffs, ridding you of the upgraded magic in favor of getting physical and magical attack buffs. Which is nice in a variety of situations, like maybe your amped up character runs out of MP, because the downside of the upgraded magic is that it does cost MP now, or maybe the enemy puts on a magical counter shield, and it doesn't feel like you got cheated out for the setup you did to buff your character's magic because you can just amp charge, consume the buffs, and focus on the next plan of attack. I mean just think about it, the only way to get a physical attack buff is by consuming a buff that upgrades your magic. And what I just talked about is one interaction with these skills. This game is full of this stuff. It's always thinking about the next step. I haven't even talked about the aura system yet, which cooldown mechanics is kind of like a callback to Rain's turns in Crescent Prism, skills that take MP every turn from the caster in return for something else. But here's the thing, you can have amazingly fun and interesting player mechanics, but it means absolutely nothing if the enemies aren't engaging as well. 
and luckily this is something that Tor 60 games are very good at. I've already mentioned this several times, but enemies have a variety of ways to encourage the player to switch roles, from giving themselves statuses to reflect or dodge magical or physical attacks, to having stats that may favor the player attacking with magic or physical, which you can find out by scanning the enemy. But I don't know, I feel like this may be the kind of nerdy stuff that only I pay attention to. Other than that, enemies' weaknesses and resistances help you change characters around. And just like Soma Spears, there's some enemies that have the ability to straight up force the party to switch roles, which is still really cool. And it can really throw someone off who hasn't been experimenting with the role system more. This game punishes you for trying to do everything the same way, for being inflexible. Because while you have a lot of answers for nearly every problem, it's knowing everything you can do in the moment that will end up giving you the upper hand in battle. It's like being at a dance party. You move with what you have and know that you can do, but when the tone and beat shifts, you either adapt to it or you're just gonna get left behind. I suppose a side effect of this, and also because I was playing hard mode, is that random encounters can take quite a bit. But I realized that I don't really have a problem with that, because I'm still having a blast. Even with the same formation, every fight feels a little different. There's just so many factors going into it. So yeah, the random encounters are really fun. You know you've done a good job when you give it random encounters instant death attacks and I'm somehow still not pissed off by the end of it. With the random encounters in mind, you might be wondering, are the bosses any good? Are the bosses any good? Are the bosses any good? Hey, who is this? Hey, you can go. Yeah, get out of here. I don't have time to waste with people like you. Oh, wait. Oh, oh, C come back. You must be new. Come back, come back. Let me educate you. The wildest thing about Torch 60 games is despite how enjoyable the dungeons and battles are, the boss fights peak at the, the best parts of the gameplay. There's nothing that gets me more excited than seeing that a boss is coming up. Torch 60's bosses have always had an effort to be interesting, having interesting mechanics to learn and play against. Because while it's one thing for the player to have fun mechanics, the enemies need them too. They need to be fun to fight. It's stuff like that that makes encounters more skill and knowledge based rather than stat gates to see how much you grinded beforehand. A good example of this is one of the bosses you encounter early on. It's very simple, the boss starts by putting up several shields of different elements. This is still early on, when you're still getting used to these characters, so it teaches you to remember which character identifies with which elements. It furthermore engages with the role system, you have to switch roles or start using support commands to give the elements needed. And the choices you make will not only be dependent on the elemental shields that are randomly picked out, but also the current layout of the party. Hell, sometimes a certain character's element won't even show up. In that case, you might want to consider moving them to support. But you could also infuse their physical attack with an element if you see that a character with that element is currently in support. And this is just a fight that's early on. One thing that's important is that it never feels like you're playing a very specific way the dev wants you to play. Just in my last example, I mentioned multiple ways to handle the boss. Not every fight is like that as well. There are more straightforward fights that the player has full reign to experiment with how to handle a longer encounter. But there's usually interesting things that always happen throughout the fight, whether it be the boss changing forms to something as simple as summoning in minions can go a long way. It never really feels like you solved the boss like a minute in and then just use the same skills until the fight is over. This was something I was thinking about myself, but skills in this game in general are learned as the story goes on. Leveling doesn't do nothing but change numbers. And I think Soma Union is a good example of a game that takes advantage of knowing what the player has at all times, while still giving them room to experiment. I think it strikes a good balance in that regard. And at this point, I know what you're thinking. Hey Spacey, can you stop screwing around and get on with it? Okay, okay, fine. But there's still some few things I want to talk about. I think I finally come around to health bars in JRPGs. Yeah, look at them. I never had anything against them, you just rarely got to see them in traditional turn-based JRPGs. And I always found something satisfying about not knowing how much health something like a boss had, because it makes it all the more exciting when you finally do beat the boss. But here you always know. I don't know, something about having health bars feels like I have some forbidden knowledge. It's like a cheat code is on. Because knowing enemy health is such a game changer, and gives the player much more of an advantage than you think. Most relevant of this is that it allows the player to play more efficiently. You'll know which attacks will knock out an enemy, so you can split attacks between multiple enemies better. And you're more likely to avoid situations where you say, use several party members to physically attack enemy B because enemy A has a physical counter going on. The commands play out only for your first physical attack to defeat enemy B, leading to the commands to carry over 
and causing you to physically attack enemy A, who currently has a physical counter and gets slapped up for no good reason at all. Plus it's nice on RPGs where you can heal by defending, because then you know when the enemy is low on health and you can have one party member finish the job while the other two heal with defend. Status effects are the next thing I want to talk about. What's neat about summon union is that status effects work on everyone, even bosses. You can poison every boss, lower their accuracy with dazzle, etc. And I like that game dev mindset of, if I'm going to give the players the ability to use status effects, then those status effects should work on everyone. I even like how the game tells you that status effects work on everyone, because typically we all know that by now you shouldn't do things like poisoning a boss. It's just not going to work. It's actually very rare I bother putting status effects on enemies in JRPGs, because I feel like half the time I'm just wasting a turn to find out that they resist it, and in games with so many enemies it's hard to know whether or not certain enemies resist certain status effects, so I typically don't bother with it, and that makes me really appreciate the approach that this game takes. And it's not like you can just mindlessly use status effects in every encounter, because unless you have a certain gimmick weapon, the only way you're giving status effects is by support buffing another character's magic. So while it costs two characters to set up, the payoff is knowing that it's going to work 100% guaranteed, and I think that makes it worth going for. Even letting people like me who typically don't do debuffing stuff experiment with something that they aren't used to. I guess some last things I want to talk about are some gameplay mechanics that I haven't mentioned yet. These are really my only complaints for this game in general, and while I wouldn't call these mechanics I'm about to talk about bad, I just say that they feel a little half-baked. Firstly, the star chart. And I know what you're thinking, Spacey, there's an entire skill tree and you haven't brought it up until now? Well, let me explain. Remember that purple stuff I mentioned a while back that you collect in dungeons? This is stardust. You actually get it from a lot of things, most notably you get some after fights. Stardust is the currency used to buy upgrades on the skill tree. The tree provides your party with things such as stat increases, buffs to your healing via spells or items, and more. Design wise, there's a lot of good stuff here. Firstly, by the end of the game, you won't have everything here, and if you did, you grinded. But I ain't judging. But I like these kind of trees because knowing you won't get everything by the end makes the choices more impactful. Next, you can pay money to reset the tree so you can roll back on mistakes, or if you want to pool your stardust to purchase one of the more expensive upgrades. Another good thing, which I swear is something only I tested, is that even if you don't have your full team with you, purchasing stat upgrades on the tree still affects those absent party members when they do join back up. I know, I know, I should have trusted Torch 60 games more by now, but this is the kind of stuff that most devs wouldn't account for and miss out on. Finally. Collecting the Stardust is pretty fun. So all this is fine, but as I said earlier, I have my complaints. I'm still not entirely sure if I have a problem with the size of the skill tree or not. I mean, I'm not asking for a skill tree that looks like this, but this is pretty small, which makes the progression of this feel rather slow. But you could arguably say that it also makes the upgrades you get more impactful, meaningful, because you don't get them all the time. But that's kind of my next issue. I'll admit that I played this wrong, basically just ignoring the tree at first until I had enough to dive straight into the XP bonus, because why would I not get that as soon as possible? But in reality, I should have invested in other things and then reset it when I had enough for the XP upgrade. Though honestly, can you blame me? I feel like none of these are impactful enough to make any difference. Like, I don't know, is increasing my party speed by 3 going to make a huge difference? Or increasing my crit rate by 1? Well, yeah, it will make a difference. But it doesn't feel like it will make a difference. Some of these upgrades don't feel very useful at all, like increasing the healing from orbs you collect in dungeons. This could just be a mindset thing, but while the orbs are fun to collect, I think they're pretty useless because this game is constant with giving you access to full healed checkpoints. And not getting ambushed by random encounters? This is treated as like some sort of huge upgrade, but I'm gonna be honest, I only got ambushed like 3 to 5 times, why would I spend so much stardust on that? But not everything on his tree is useless. I think upgrading the healing your party can do is pretty major. A lot more major than upgrading these orbs that you have no control over. I can heal whenever I want, but these healing orbs? That's an uncertain factor. That's up to the dev. And I'm only bringing this up because the whole side of the tree is dedicated to the orbs. The star chart is cool, but it feels unnecessary. Maybe I wish there was more to it. And maybe that's just because numbers going up isn't very hype for me. 
One thing I've been trying to do better as a reviewer is to not bring up things I wish was in what I was reviewing, but instead talk about what is here. And what is here, I do enjoy. I was regularly entering here to progress in the tree. I was getting a little bit happy collecting the stardust knowing that I can get something. It's just that I can't help but feel that if none of this was here, the game wouldn't feel any different. I don't think it adds much, but I'm glad it is here. If anything, it does help to give some identity that makes Soma Union stick out. The next gameplay mechanic I wasn't totally a fan of was the power gym system. Remember how I said that this game had a way to let you skip encounters? Yeah, like god dang 90 hours ago. God, this video is so long. Well, that's what the power gems are. Every dungeon has three of them, and you can use one to skip an encounter, only receiving half the rewards from the fight. Okay, cool, right? Well, here's the situation. If you save those power gems until the end of the dungeon, you get rewarded for not spending them. And I'm not talking small rewards, I'm talking future equipment, permanent stat ups. Like make the comparison, would you rather give up something that will affect you for the entire game just because you wanted to skip a couple random encounters? There's a rather major imbalance here I feel. I don't know, I feel like instead of giving half rewards for skipping, you'd need like quadruple the reward, something to tempt you to skip a fight. I'd rather just take the risk of running away from the fight turn 1 than wasting a power gem on a skip anyways. Yeah, I enjoyed collecting them and I went on my way to find them, and I was excited going to the end of the dungeon, all power gems ready to get some cool things. But they might as well have just been boss drops because honestly if I accidentally used one of these gems to skip a fight, I would have probably reset the game. There was never a point, even on hard mode where I was like, okay I have to skip this encounter, my resources are low and I'm not gonna make it. And if there was, I'd rather just take the risk of running away from the fight turn 1 than wasting a power gem on a skip anyways. They could have just removed the skipping fight feature of these get gems entirely and just say, you get extra bonuses if you manage to find all 3 power gems by the end of the dungeon. And it's a shame, because I actually thought the idea was pretty neat, but I prefer the skipping in the previous games, although I do respect the attempt of innovation here, it just didn't feel like the risk reward was worth it. And I guess one thing you have to understand is that my complaints are subjective. Everyone has their own thoughts on certain game design stuff and whether or not they like it, because believe it or not, most devs don't put in mechanics they think are bad on purpose. <laughs> this is just simple idea clashing. But with that in mind, what I haven't mentioned is that there is a major flaw here with the power gem system. I'm talking big. A huge oversight that I'm honestly really shocked the dev didn't account for. Why would I want to skip an encounter? when this game is so much fun. I love the gameplay of this game so much. Every fight was just a ton of fun to participate in. Even when I was backtracking or wandering around aimlessly on my own accord, I was always hyped when a battle started. Because there's always that part in JRPG where you just get tired of fighting. But that's the thing. This is the first time I have ever played an RPG where I never got tired of battles. And that, that's impressive. Even when these encounters can last quite a bit due to hard mode, it was never boring, never tiring like other RPGs I played. It made me realize something, something deep inside I never realized. I never actually disliked random encounters in RPGs, it was never the random encounters at fault, it was the battle systems that were the issue. Or maybe the wildly high encounter rate a lot of the older games had, but hey, hey I'm trying to make a point here. And I think perhaps the scenario design in general helped with this. As you never have to backtrack to previous areas in this game, you're always fighting new and stronger enemies in new locations, always pushing forward. This was the kind of game I was always excited to play, and when I sat down to play it, I never wanted to stop. It is very rare I encounter, pun intended, a game that is like this, and this game took me like 15 or so hours to beat. It's also very rare that a game manages to flip my idea on random encounters. Hell, this idea has been changing throughout my entire Torch 60 experience. Dare I say? I prefer it over on screen encounters. I mean I like being able to avoid fights at my leisure, but I can do that in random encounter systems just by choosing to run away, unless if your game sucks and running away doesn't do anything, but that's besides the point. I can see why on screen encounters were only a thing for Soma Spirits. And that's not to say there aren't points where you can avoid enemies, it's a mixture of both, albeit majority random encounters. Simply put, Soma Union's gameplay is amazing, amazing more, amazing most. I mean, just look at how long I've been talking about the gameplay for, that's telling on its own. Even the stuff I wasn't a fan of wasn't bad, it just felt ultimately unnecessary to me. 
Even now I feel unsatisfied with what I've had here, because there are so many intricate things at play. I could go to town talking about all the different skill interactions, the boss mechanics, and the game design things at play here. Maybe the reason I like this game so much is that there really isn't anything outside of the player's control. Like, you have the tools to handle every situation and encounter in this game. There's always an answer. If you get a game over in this game, it's all on you. And I think that's nice. I suppose the side effect of this is that even hard mode wasn't very tough for me. But the other side effect is that this game is just pleasant, and even though I never got a game over, it still felt like a challenge, which I feel like is a very hard thing to do. Because I never felt that I was too powerful, which I feel like is a very hard thing to do. Because maybe in the end, the most important thing about games are the emotions that they make you feel. But I think I covered all the bases, and we do need to move on about now. And all the stuff I didn't mention? Maybe that's for you to discover when you play through this game. Which should be about now, because I'm going to look at my playthrough of Summit Union and talk about everything that happens in that game. So hey, go and play through Summit Union if you're enticed to, and maybe before that, play the other Torch 60 games, at least Soma Spirits. This playthrough is going to spoil Soma Spirits and basically every other Torch 60 game, but honestly, Summit Union feels like such a fan service fest that I have to cover it all. The dev may say that you don't need to play the other games to play this one, which is true, but I think playing the other games beforehand will make you love this game so much more. It really adds to the experience, and these are all fantastic and unique games in their own way, so I say go for it. Hell, recently Sergeant M made Yusha and Soma Spirits name your price, so you can get all these games for free. Though you know, maybe you could put a little money on it, I'm just saying. I mean, if you're willing to put $60 on the next big AAA disaster, you can at least throw some support on people who make games out of love and passion. But I ain't judging. But I am, though. Alright. I hope you played all the games. If you haven't, then I don't know. Feel free to just chill out with me. I was super excited when this game came out, and I'm gonna show my love. I even made cornbread before playing it. I had the cornbread specially on hand for Union's release day. Because let me tell you, when the cornbread comes out, Things are gonna get good. You know, I always forget to talk about the title screens in these videos. For as much as I make fun of games with lazy title screen pictures, I've been forgetting the cool ones. I love all the color in this, alongside the theme of the colors of purple, blue, and green, from the main characters, the orbs flying around them, and even the title logo, which I must say is a very pretty gradient. The game opens with a character named Zero staring off into the stars from a spaceship known as the Virtue watching out as if searching for something. They wonder just how long it's been since they've seen anything out there, before their clock friend Dockington shows up. I know, very familiar grounds. Dockington tells Zero to cheer up and stay hopeful, but Zero seems to be anything but hopeful. They go to sleep, with Zero wondering if they'll ever find it. Thus, the prologue begins. <laughs> Zero wakes up in a strange world, where they find a ball for him bouncing all around, and decides to follow it. We catch up with the orb and we learn that we are in Zero's dreams, and that Zero himself is a magical being known as a spirit. The orb tells us that if we keep exploring, we may find a way to wake up, and joins the party. And unlike the party members that will be mainstays for our journey, this dude has star magic. I don't know. But I feel like when you have star magic in a Torch 60 game, you're like, put on the automatic cool list. Even you, Horus. Maybe it's just because it's a non-traditional element, but at the same time, stars being an element to fight with is pretty cool. Anyways, we find this castle here and open it up, only to encounter our first fight. Little silly willies? They're looking rather mean? Menacing? Alright, listen up you oversized boba ball. If you keep it up with the corny comments, you're gonna make me retract what I said about star elemental users. Watch it. Also, Zero, leave it to me, I'll just sit over there and hope they leave without an issue? Come on, this is your dream, you can't be getting folded in your own dreams. There's something funny about how many Torch 60 enemies look so happy when you encounter them, but in reality they're just here to beat you up. We learn how to fight, which I always end up doing the tutorials for these games even though I already know how the genre works, but I do it just in case there's any specific mechanics to learn. Some fights later, we find Dockington, and his red ball friend. Being a writer, Dockington has the power to record our progress, much like Doctory from Soma Spirits, 
while his red ball friend can give us the full heals. It's around here that we get our first sigil too, teaching us the spirit skill of Pulse, which I am not kidding you, is the best spirit skill in the game. Just read the description, it's a must have at all times. It reminds me of that one dark skill Volza had in Brave Hero Yusha that I was quite a fan of, but in this game it also does damage on the turn it's used. It's also the only magical skill you get that targets everyone for uh, the entire game. It's an all in one package, it's cheap too, must have skill. We continue to explore this dream dungeon, as we learn that the orb has actually been leading us to something that they want to show us. So let's find out just what it is. Dang Zero, knocked out in your own dream. You'd think that'd wake you up. We finish the dungeon with a fight against the Sorcerer Orb, which one, godlike name. Two, I like the boss introduction pop-ups here, very cool. This boss revolves around switching elemental resistances and weaknesses between Zero's ice magic and the orb's star magic. The background changing between falling snow and moving stars is really cute too. We defeat the boss, which the orb identifies it alongside all the other enemies we've encountered as nightmares, something that wasn't always here. But more importantly, they finally get to show off the thing that they've been wanting us to see. Nothing! Well dang Zero, I thought the view was pretty at least. But that's the point, there was something here, plenty of great things which are all gone now, because when there's nothing on the horizon to reach for, you can either let it stay like that for the rest of your life, or you can put something there. Before Zero can understand any of the uncertainties of what the orb is, or what they should be placing there, they are woken up by none other than Rekka. Zero is told to meet up with the captain of the ship, and we're off. Like any main character of a Torch 60 game, Zero's got that Brave Hero Yusha merch. And they got a Cooler Crusader poster too? Zero, you got good taste. We explore around the ship and talk to the other residents, quite a few being spirits much like Zero. Notable is down the shop, we get to see Minister Orange from Crescent Prism again. Apparently his homeworld got destroyed and we picked him up. Yeah, I suppose that is pretty accurate to what happened. I guess Lunita did not do a very good job as an oracle. Anyways, wait, hold up. Hey, Zero, stop screwing around with the spears and the staves and pick up the shooty shooty, yeah? Useless old spirit. Where's Almost when you need him? That's the kid who packed heat. Oh yeah. Well, I'm sure he's fine. Man, Optimize is such a meme. There has to be a way to get rid of that, right? But on the other hand, it is pretty funny. It wouldn't feel right if it was gone, but I also wouldn't care if it was. I like the images showing shopkeepers now too by the way, I think that's nice. This is the second floor of the Virtue. There's three floors with the first being where the people sleep and the second being the shop area where you'll find yourself coming back to a lot. The second floor also has the Garden Dome, which we can't enter yet, but we'll be there quite a few times throughout the course of this game. The third floor is where the main control to the ship lies, known as the bridge. This is where the captain is. Well, there's also the clinic and the information center, which the latter includes a library, a training area, and an arcade. With the doctor currently out of the clinic, it's time we do what we're supposed to, and meet the captain. Now at the bridge, let me just say I'm quite a fan of this beer with the jacket here. Maybe I just have a certain bias towards gray jackets if you catch my drift, but I respect the fit. All right, here's Guidance, the captain, or well, Captain Guidance. He's kind of a jerk, but he is pretty cool. Cool looking, he's still a jerk. It's here we learn that these characters have been aboard their ship for what is nearing the 20th year. 20 years since Soma was destroyed, and they've just been stuck on this small as hell ship. That kind of sucks. The captain seems very aggressive and adamant about sending Zero to the Garden Dome that I mentioned earlier, and orders Rekka to take them there. Rekka now joins the party here. She complains about this big old meanie, but then the doctor comes through. This is Lumen. We don't see much of him here, but he's definitely the grumpiest of grumpsters. With the Garden Dome open, we enter. Though there doesn't really seem like there's much to do here. 
Rekka talks about eventually growing into a big tree and watching over the people of Soma, once they find it of course, much like Elder Oakley from Soma Spirits. And not gonna lie Rekka, that sounds pretty boring, but I guess it isn't much different from being stuck on a ship all this time. In fact, her whole life was spent on this ship as she was born a year after the destruction of Soma. She recounts the life and death of Soma from what she've heard. This begins with a monarch, if you played Soma Spirits you might remember this as the Sun King. And I'm not gonna lie, I completely forgot about this character. I don't know, my memory sucks, but when I think of Soma Spirits, I think mostly of the relationship between heart and soul, and when it comes to villains, I just think of the main villains of form and dissonance. Which is actually what is being recalled here, form and dissonance seeking the Sun King's power, and heart and soul putting them down. God I love these two. This is the first time that Soma got screwed over. As for the second time? Well that's for Lumen to tell as he walks in. He was actually on Soma when it was destroyed. A horrible light spawning forth monsters suddenly appearing in the sky, before turning a blinding white and fracturing the planet, with everyone being gathered onto the virtue. I can't believe that they've been traveling for 20 years now and haven't found anything. Dang, the space in this world kinda sucks. Or maybe they just got unlucky. All I'm saying is that with one right turn, they might have ended up seeing some cool stuff. With story time over, I mean, their story time, we're still gonna be here for at least another hour. Some monsters spawn on the ship, seemingly being the ones that destroyed Soma. So we team up and we defeat them. Several more spawn in and are defeated by the trio. With all defeated, Zero gets a vision of the orb from their dreams before a bright light knocks everyone out. And looking through the outside of the dome, the trio sees a landmass, one with trees and water. Guidance, I mean Captain Guidance, calls Zero to the bridge, ending the prologue. Well, actually chapter 1 hasn't really started yet, but this helps with the video pacing. We report to the captain on what happened, and Lumen confirms that this is the Jubilee jungle, and it is a part of Soma. Gaidi orders Zero to investigate the jungle, saying that all spirits have a purpose and a thing that they represent, with Zero still unsure of what their purpose is, alongside them being an enthusiastic Rekka and a reluctant Lumen, solidifying our party. You know, despite Lumen seemingly not wanting to go, I bet he secretly wants to anyways. I mean, he already says this ship is whack, and dude, it's Soma, man. You tell me you'd rather stay on this ship instead of seeing Soma again? Stop lying. Anyways, Captain Guidance, you know what? You are my captain, why am I calling you by your title? Guidance also gives the trio some debuffing skills that I never really could gauge their effect, but at the same time I did use them nearly every fight. Before leaving though, let's look around the ship once more. The previously unavailable library is now accessible. While there isn't much to do here, there is a book talking about spirits. Most interesting is that it says that spirits are named after an aspect or emotion that they want to represent. Hmm, well with that in mind, none of these characters ever really get names for a very good reason we'll get to later, but I like to imagine the one on the left in the snazzy jacket is named Drip. But this does explain Captain Guidance's name. Before leaving, I make sure to go around and talk to everyone on the ship because, well, I don't know, I like these characters. Alright, let's rumble in the jungle. As we land, we view a mysterious conversation happening between two characters, though we can't glean much from it. This is where chapter 1 actually starts, but you know we kinda already went through all of that. God, I've had my video so much with worthless dialogue. Hey, we're finally here at the Jubilee Jungle. And much like me when I go outside for the first time in years, Rekka's amazed to see all the plants and trees. Guidance didn't really give us a plan on what we should do, so let's just explore and see what's going on here. You know, by this point, whenever I see an Uzi in a Torch 60 game, I feel like everything is right in the world. Aw, oh, come on, Zero, you got folded again? By an Uzi? Not like this. I mean, the enemies didn't target anyone else, so quite frankly, your luck is trash. And I don't mean the luck stat, because that's not in this game. You're just unfortunate, buddy. But this is kind of a reoccurring trend from my playthrough, where Zero would just get KO'd a lot more than anyone else. And I'm pretty certain the XP share doesn't work to unconscious party members, so Zero just kind of steadily fell behind. And it's not like they're squishy or anything, I always gave them the new armor first, but it just kept happening over and over throughout the entire game. Poor Zero. Moving on, we encounter a battle food between two warring factions, Tomatoes and Blueberries. The fight breaks up and the leader of the Tomatoes, Sergeant Tomato, tells us to meet him at the Tomatoes base. 
That's a lot of tomatoes used in one sentence. I should have changed that in the script, but whatever. Here at the base, we learn the reason for the two fighting. There's a temple with artifacts belonging to the Sun King nearby, and the blueberries have stolen some of it. We're tasked with invading the Blueberry's camp as spies to sneak attack, flank and spank style. Despite being an inhabitant on Soma, when told that Zero is a spirit, the sergeant has no idea what his spirit is, leaving Zero and everyone else kind of confused. Regardless, we learn Magic Amp, making us certified gamers, and we make our way to the enemy camp, with Rekka being really determined to go. She reveals this is because acorns like her are typically tasked with watching over forests and woodlands such as these. And she wants to get both sides of the story, and ideally resolve the war some way or another. Lumen doesn't really want to do this, and honestly I'd rather be peeping at Sun King Temple myself, but... And Zero's kind of just indifferent. On our way, we seem to be tailed by one of the mysterious people on that Discord call from earlier. The Blueberry Leader tells us the exact same story, but with the tomatoes being the thieves. So we just decide to say screw it and head to the darn temple ourselves. One concept of this world that I find to be pretty fascinating, and this game kind of touches on, but I'm not sure if it's intentional, is how even over a century after the fall of the Sun King, there are still characters you meet who value, worship, and have respect for the Sun King and the artifacts made in his image during his reign. Despite the Sun King being a terrible dictator and ultimately nearly destroying Soma, there are still people that will defend him and wish to preserve the era in which he ruled. And maybe I'm looking too deep into this story, but I think that stuff is pretty interesting. <laughs> At the temple, we're joined by the two Orbos and get a boss fight against this plant monster known as the Tangle Terror. This boss is weak to fire and poisons your party a lot. If you know me, I always stack up on the status cure items early on, which is no different here. However, when you're getting hit by full party poison spells, I didn't find using those items that useful. Just have someone on support to keep everyone healed and you'll be good. The boss is weak to fire, which is Rekka's magic. It might have been best to have Rekka on support, infusing another member's physical attacks with fire, as Rekka's magical attack stat isn't the highest, but I didn't think it mattered that much, and I opted to have the party just use magic amp on her instead. After the boss fight, the two army dudes run off in, with the goal of proving the other did in fact steal the artifact of the Sun King. Lumen questions if Rekka still wants to help these guys, with Rekka saying that acorns like her are destined to do so, to guide the people of Soma. Farther confusion is brought forth when Guidance calls, wanting a report. He doesn't seem to be very interested in the fact that we found living people, rather than whether or not we found a way to bring Soma together, leaving Rekka to wonder what it's really like to be a leader. Before entering the temple though, I return to the virtue and stock up on some new items and- <gasps> Oh my god! Almost! You've been turned into a marketable plushie! No! I think I'll set you down right here. Looking good. Back at the temple, we explore around with the tomato and the blueberry, who are kind of helping each other out. Also, these rock enemies here, oh wowie these rockos. I love how they basically have the ability to knock out anyone they want with their triple attack. I'm not even kidding when I say this is one of the hardest non-boss enemies in the game, because they just consistently knocked out party members. Also, peep these spider enemies here, wowie. Sorry, I'm saying wowie too much, but you can't stop me. Nearing the end of the dungeon, we run into a pretty surprising jump scare in the form of these three stone people. I guess this doesn't technically count as a boss, but I was kind of scared when these three were thrown at me with no warning. I didn't heal. My MP. Cool designs though. I actually kind of wish we saw more of these three. They're each weak to one of our party members elements, meaning ideally you should have everyone on power or infusing magic. but. The only MP I really had was on zero, so I had to keep them in support, and nobody had enough MP for conjuring or amp magic plays. It might also just be best to team up on one of them and take them out one at a time. Upon defeat, they give us their powers, with zero learning Gale, Rekka with Quake, not, 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 not that Quake, and Lumen with Splash. Rekka tries to get the two army orbs to make up, but they're too stubborn, with her wondering how she's supposed to guide the people of Soma with it like this. And on one hand, I understand where she's coming from. She's lived her whole life on a ship with like 20 people. So when these end up being the first people she meets on Soma, yeah, I'd be worried too. But I'm sure there's more rational people on Soma. Before we have too much time to ponder that, we're finally confronted by our mysterious follower. Whoever she is, she doesn't seem to be too friendly. 
but I do agree with Zero here. She is pretty cool. She seems to know who Zero is and is ready to battle them. Before he can fight, the bridge that she's standing on collapses below her, and well, that's that for that. Though we actually do find her again like a couple seconds later. Before we can understand what her deal is, she runs off, leaving us to fight the Grand Granite, that one cool boss I talked about earlier in the gameplay section of this video. Take out the shield, and then go all out with her defense list. You can probably find some time to buff up a member's magic right before it's time to go in on the boss, but that's all dependent on the shields that are currently up. After that, shows up once more, taking on a new form as she fights and defeats the two army orbs. We give chase, where she reveals that the artifact left here by the Sun King is indeed still here. But before we can get our hands on it, she finally fights us, revealing her name as Alpha and saying she has the intention of waking Zero up. God, I love her fight theme so much. Like, I'm so sad it's only used here. It's too good to just be used once, you know. Anyways, keep it up with the stat debuffs because she can do some heavy damage, but she herself is kinda debuff city, lowering stats and stunning, so depending on who gets hit with what, you're going to have to be changing roles, and quite literally too because she also has an attack that forces everyone into their opposite roles, without being able to change back for a turn. The constant debuffs and stuns means that going for easy strategies like magic amping can get stomped out pretty quick. Halfway through the fight, she drops the info that she's working under some professor before powering up. Now she does even more damage, so you better keep your heals constant. She has an attack where she's seeking out targets which leads to a full party attack the next turn that can deal some good damage even when blocking. Some point before this fight, you can get your hands on a fire resistance ring, and whoever you put that on is going to be able to hold out a lot longer. After we defeat her, she retreats, leaving Zero confused to who this is. But luckily, the artifact we came here for reveals itself. Even after kind of breaking up the fight between the two warring enemies, Rekka wonders how she'll be able to guide the people of Soma if they can't guide themselves, and if she is really up to that task in the first place. The artifact begins to speak to Rekka, saying that it has the power that will shape itself to the will of the bearer of it. And it's here that Rekka and I suppose the player are asked what future Rekka envisions on her horizon. Destiny. I want to guide Soma's people onto the right path. Or freedom. I want Soma's people to make the right choices their own way. This is a very interesting decision and it gives me flashbacks to the first choice of Soma Spirit with the acorn who didn't want to be an elder but rather explore the world and help people their own way. And I still think being some great tree that watches over people is pretty boring. As irresponsible as it may seem, I went with freedom. Because I wouldn't want to tell people what to do with their lives, and I wouldn't want people to tell me what to do with mine. Even if technically I am telling someone what to do with their life right now. With the decision made, the artifact tells us when all four artifacts come together, the power to shape the world will be ours. Meaning this might just be our way to get Soma back. Rekka wonders if she made the right choice. Thinking about what her grandpa would say about it, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not sure if he would be happy, Rekka. With the question of being able to potentially shape the world, we make our way back to the captain to report on it, not before Alpha comes back out of nowhere with the lamest cheap shot I've ever seen, attacking Zero in hopes of waking them up. Zero begins to change forms to the same kind we saw with Alpha, seeing a vision of that strange monster that Lumen referenced earlier. As Zero is overtaken, the orb from Zero's dream shows up and knocks them out of it. As Zero blacks out, they hear a rather ominous message regarding something known as Absolution. And with that, chapter 1 is over. Intense. Well, not really. Chapter 2 starts like an hour from now. Okay, this formula isn't gonna work. We're gonna need to edit this differently. What am I supposed to call this for the YouTube chapters? I don't know. Chapter 1 Intermission, I guess. Yeah baby, let's roll with that. Seemingly in a flashback, we are introduced to three new characters, Bright and these two brothers, Rosen and Silvio. Rosen is leading the group to this forest where apparently someone was murdered in, in the hopes of finding some treasure. Which yeah, I guess is pretty accurate to the stupid things kids do. The group travels through the forest, tying rope bridges thanks to Bright and his power of board. With this ability, he can cross any gap as long as it's only three tiles long. And I don't know if it was like the cornbread starting to get to me, or maybe I truly am just impressively incompetent, 
But this is the reason I'm glad I don't do Let's Plays or stream these games on a first time playthrough. Because what followed was an impressive showing of lack of wit. These puzzles got me pretty good with trying to find the path to take with the board. Anyways, we make it a bit in before Rosen decides to make it a race to the treasure, which honestly there probably isn't any treasure, but he and Silvio run off, leaving Bright wandering alone. Completely lost, Bright ends up encountering a giant tree with eyes, which he's pretty surprised by, but I don't know, considering the assumed people of Soma I've met so far, I'd be more surprised to see a human at this point. The tree introduces himself as Elder Oakley, and listen, my mind is still pretty foggy on Soma Spirits. If I were a good reviewer, I would have replayed Soma Spirits before this video, but I do remember Elder Oakley. He helps out Bright by giving him some directions to find his friends, and before Bright can hear Oakley's final warning, he takes off. He ends up taking a very wrong turn, and ends up... ends up. You can see it in the footage. I looked at the layout of this area, and it hit me. I don't even lie. A part of me wanted to start tearing up. I'm not even sure if this was the intention, but this place looks very similar to Heart and Soul's home in Soma Spirits. Bright breaks into a shack for some reason, revealing it to be abandoned. A faded paper details someone potentially protecting something very dangerous. Bright finds a key to this very dangerous thing and heads to the center. Uh, hey Bright buddy, shouldn't you be uh, looking for your friends? You don't, you don't need a, we're just gonna go in here? Yeah, okay. He enters some secret chamber, and upon crossing a gap, loses his board for good, trapping him. Well, let's hope there's nothing bad up ahead. Oh. Hey, Bright, we gotta go. <laughs> we gotta go. We gotta get the hell out. Oh, Bright, we- Oh, God, he's dead. With no choice but for it, Bright awakens a mask-like monster in the shape of a face. It tries to convince Bright that it is powerful and can help him find his friends. Upon hearing Bright's name, it even compares Bright to the sun, transforming into a golden color, which is kinda corny, but whatever. It once again tries to convince Bright to wear them, saying it can grant any wish. The mask does manage to convince Bright by saying that it can give them the power to never lose anybody again, and do all the good Bright wants to do in this world. Which seems to work, as we see Bright grabbing the mask, starting his reign as the Sun King. I'm not entirely sure why this mask is here and who wrote this note. I guess maybe it was the supposed killer, but I kinda find it hard to believe with this mask and so much power all they did was kill one person and then hit it. I originally thought it was just some made up story by Oakley and friends to keep people from finding it, you know, scary story about a murderer and whatnot. but then why hide the key right next to where the mask is if you don't want anyone to grab it? I think I might be missing out on something pretty obvious, but I don't know. If the board footage didn't convince you already, when it comes to my intelligence, let's just say I'm not the brightest monster around. Once again we're Zero, who wakes up in their dream world again, seemingly seeing everything with Bright that we just saw. That orb shows up again and they discuss what happened to Zero, with Zero saying they felt extremely angry before they got knocked out. Whoever this orb is, it seems to see everything that, that has happened on Zero's adventure thus far, meaning they're a lot more than just some random dream character Zero created on a whim. Orby says that there is something that they want to show us, and we're led once more to the horizon, except something has been placed there, but that's just it, they don't know what it is, and agreed that they need to find some way to bring it closer. It's here we get more information on our orb friend, they seem to talk as if they lost a lot of memories and don't entirely know much about themselves. A short walk later leads us to a bedroom, where the two agree that Zero should wake up, because maybe going on another adventure will bring that object on the horizon closer. The two say their farewells as Zero literally jumps themselves into bed, because I guess when you're in the dream world, going to sleep wakes you up? Zero wakes up in the ship's clinic, discovering that they've actually been knocked out for like 5 days. The captain wants to hear everything that happened from Zero's perspective, and tells us to head to the garden dome when we're ready. With Zero still wondering about that boy in the forest. Hmm. Ooh, new gear! Listen up, everybody. I've got money in my pockets and items on my mind. Calculator? Oh, I know, my friend. I'm a calculator. I'm telling you, the writing in this game is genius. After my typical talks to all the characters, we arrive in the Garden Dome, where we see those monsters we encountered from last time. Upon seeing Zero, they get the flash of that eye in the sky alongside the text of Absolution once more. The monsters rush down Zero and we fight. After defeating them, more of them appear and we go to take them out. As we- gosh darn it Zero, you're slump already? Come on. Anyways, 
As we finish off the last of them, the group begins to question why they acted aggressively towards Zero, and just what happened to Zero when they transformed. We meet the captain on the bridge, where Zero asks what Absolution is. We get the answer we would expect, with Absolution being Alongside being the final boss of Soma Spirits, being defeated by heart and soul, it's an extremely strong entity with its powers sought out by many. Guidance brings up the orb that Rekka collected earlier, and saying that we need to find more of these in order to restore Soma. He once again reminds Zero about spirits having purposes, and says that Zero will find theirs soon. He asks us to return the orb to Rekka. We talk to Lumen along the way, who seems to insult Guidance's constant talking about how spirits have a purpose, causing Zero to wonder about purposes, and to reflect on how those people of Soma didn't know what a spirit was. They ask Lumen, who was on Soma before its destruction, if there were any spirits. Lumen says he never met any spirits until he got on the Virtue, following his father's words and assuming they were just elsewhere on Soma, while also believing his dad may have just been lying, showing their relationship isn't great. As much of a grump Lumen is, he and I definitely share some same ideas of self-care. Lumen reminds us that we should give Rekka her orb back. Golly, how many times am I going to say orb in this video? He tells us to go to the Garden Dome where Rekka should be. Rekka and Zero look out to the stars as they reflect that this was both of their first journeys to Soma, as Zero doesn't remember when they were born. Rekka recollects the fun that she had at the forest, but also the seriousness of the decisions she made to herself and her future. She realizes that being a great leader isn't about giving out orders and making others' decisions for them, rather than having the faith and knowledge of others' skills and ability to make those decisions themselves. She understands that she's going against the expectations put on her kind, going against her grandfather and his legacy, but she thinks that leading from afar is better for her, and it's what she wants to do. Zero connects the dots that her grandfather was none other than Elder Oakley, who they know about from experiencing Bright's journey. We give Rekka back her orb and go off to rest, with the hopes that it won't take another 20 years to find another piece of Soma. Zero talks once more to their orb friend, lamenting that they aren't sure where to go next, but Orby says they can lend a hand, well, you know, metaphorical hand, and immediately Zero is blasted by a bright light, with the captain bringing the trio to reveal that they have discovered yet another fragmented piece of Soma, some sort of amusement park? While the other two are excited, it seems like Lumen really doesn't want to go. With some new abilities, we make our way back to the Jubilee Forest. I was actually curious if there were any bonus things to do upon re-entering these areas, but no, don't bother. Most of the characters are gone too, it's weird. But anyways, to the amusement park. We get another glimpse of this supposed professor talking to the next character we'll be meeting that plans to awaken Zero, saying they've only given them a second chance at life because they need Zero. And I don't know about you, but this professor guy seems like a, uh, excuse my language, meanie deluxe. Oh hey, it's chapter 2, I mean... We arrive in Lampland. No roughhousing, no video games, and no bad opinions. So needless to say, I may have to keep my mouth shut here. Not too far in, we run into... Oh god. Lampy Larry. Get a load of this one. He's sort of the mascot of the place, but he also runs it too. It's not long before we learn that Lumen and him have some rather negative history, with him being mad that Lumen left him here to run the place on his own. Despite this, he's willing to help, not without us visiting the whole park first, locking off several areas, including the main tent known as the Big Top, where we need to get to. Lumen doesn't give us the whole story, but he does explain that he owns this park, but despite that, was hoping he'd never have to visit here again. Well, I guess let's try to have some fun. It's a pretty interesting environment. This theme park is just full of trash and closed off areas. It's like a mixture of amusement park and a dumpster. But I guess where I'm from, this is what most amusement parks look like anyways. Push the boxes to make the arrow point downward? That sounds easy as hell. Oh. God, I love these enemy designs. I wish I was this creative. Also, I respect the funny here. We find a place still open known as Useless Filth, and yeah, sign me up too. 
I don't know why there's a store dedicated to selling actual trash, but I guess thrift stores do exist for a reason. We end up fighting the owner of the place, the Trash Thrasher. They attack with poison and debuffs, but most painfully they can steal your MP, and in this economy, that's an issue. If you have the Wish Sigil, it can come in handy for this fight as it restores MP to the whole party at the cost of 8 SP. They also switch to a defensive form at times, but unlike most enemies with this gimmick, they don't seem to counterattack or anything if you hit them in this stance. Keep the heals up from the party wide earth magic, pay attention to any poisoned party members, and you'll be fine. We continue to make progress, playing some carnival games as we run into Larry. I like how these two come in to hear in on the combo. Everyone kind of roasts the place, with Larry venting that he has to do everything because Lumen didn't want to, and Lumen comes out with the straight fact that this is his life, his decisions, and neither Larry nor his father knew what was best for him. Hell yeah, man. Uh, sorry, I'll stop using that gif. Lumen tells the party that this place was previously owned by his father, who died before the destruction of Soma, and he was raised to be the next owner of the park. But that of course didn't happen, with him becoming a doctor and traveling abroad to virtue instead. Lumen doesn't want to be here, but sadly for him, we still have a bit to explore. We cleared the first two sections here, but now we have two more, the theater and the fun house. Let's do the fun house first. I really like this message here at the fun house, where this character says that they don't want to bother going in it because it's probably aimed towards kids, and they'd just be embarrassed by going in it, and Zero's just like, you're lost, I'm gonna have the time of my life. And I don't know if this is commentary on how some people are afraid to interact with things they'd potentially enjoy under the societal expectation that adults can't enjoy things made for kids, and the pressure of doing so is that something that deserves to leave you as an embarrassed outcast, but maybe I'm looking too deep into that. But I appreciate the message. Don't let any fears of the outside stop you from enjoying the things that you know you want to do and find enjoyment with on the inside. Unless if it's illegal. That's my spacey quote of the day, I guess. I don't know, I guess I kind of interact with media like that, you know? I mean, I suppose a lot of people do. I've watched a few shows aimed at younger audiences just because I found it simple and happy. There's an enjoyment to that. I mean, I don't really watch shows anymore, but... You know, some days I'd rather just be hopping around the colorful world of Kirby rather than shooting people in some gritty war setting. Was Kirby a good example? Those games have some mad tonal shifts, you know? That reminds me- I know, I know, I'm going off topic, just, just let me speak. But I was at some game store, like, probably over a decade or two ago, and they had these sections of games split up like, boy games, girl games. The games in each category is probably what you'd expect with the gender stereotypes, but I remember in the girls section, front and center, was Kirby. Even as a kid, I remember thinking to myself, that's pretty stupid, I'm just gonna go play some Kirby. I know that's pretty off topic, but I think about it sometimes. I guess you could arguably say that I sure think about gender a lot despite not having any. Though this also reminds me of this time I was at school, and the teacher took the class to check out some books at a library. We all brought our books in, and the teacher openly called me out in front of everyone for choosing a book made for kids. Everyone laughed at me and crap, and I was just like, I don't know, it looked cool. It was bright and colorful, and it's what I wanted to check out. But it was for kids, so I guess I wasn't allowed to enjoy it. And keep in mind, this was like grade 3 by the way. Yeesh. Hmm. Oh yeah, Soma Union. We're playing Soma Union. The funhouse is pretty cool, some neat pushing puzzles, and even a little memory matcher for you fans in the back. I see you. At the end of it, we run into the Ball Baron. Baron of the greatest ball pit in all of Soma and I can sure as hell say I'm impressed. He challenges us to fisticuffs, where upon defeating him, we learn how to give enemy status effects. The neat thing about these mini bosses that result in your party learning new skills, is that these skills are typically incorporated in the fight themselves. As such, the ball baron will dish out all sorts of status effects on the party. Though this is honestly a pretty easy fight, status effects from enemies in this game have a pretty surprising miss rate, and if you have the Pantheia Sigil equipped, which cures and prevents status effects while also giving regen, yeah I know, wowie. But yeah, if you have that Sigil, this fight is a breeze. I won't lie, the ability to put two different damage over time status effects with Pulse and Poison is surprisingly powerful. Well, I suppose all that's left before we can move on towards the end is the theater. We're told that there was a performance that was going to happen, but according to Larry, the dancer called out on a broken leg. Hmm, yeah, okay. I know deep down you probably have some dope moves though, Larry. Regardless, 
We're going to need a replacement if we want to get that key to move on. Zero and Rekka seem hopeless, but step aside, losers. Because little did they know, they had a dancer with them all along. Lumen steps up to perform, and let me tell you, the results are nothing less than glorious. Crap! RPG Maker ate my input, I promise. But don't worry, we moved hard enough to get the final key we need to enter the big top in the center of the park. Everyone pops off for Lumen, including me, as he says he's learned how to do a few things from his dad owning the place. Also, it was while doing the posing game I realized, uh, I, I realized that Lumen actually has hair. I know, I know. I, I just thought it was like a hat, you know, like one of those hat things that doctors wear. Well, I guess they're like hair nets, maybe, which would imply that he has hair regardless. Hey, y'all can go. I'm sorry. I know some of y'all have faith in me, but at this point, I'm not sure what I can say. The game even brought it up earlier, but I thought Rekka was just saying some figure of speech like hair? Lumen doesn't have hair. <laughs> Anyways, we use our keys we obtained to enter the big top where we meet the character talking to the professor from earlier, likely the next henchman to attempt to wake up Zero. They say they're here for the circus show, but I have a feeling we're going to have to throw down soon. But first, let's see the circus performance, is what I would say. But the seats are full, so we have to take the seats in the upper levels. Though as we go to it, it becomes increasingly more clear that there isn't any seats here. Big fan of the design of these enemies here, the Surge Oppressor. I love how his outlet holes have all these different expressions. That's the character design stuff I live for. We end up on a platform high above, being announced as the performers for the circus. Larry pushes us off, and I don't know about the laws in Soma, I mean the planet isn't in the best shape right now, but I'm pretty sure that's at least three cases of attempted murder. It looks like we're all doomed, but Lumen pulls everyone together to do a move known as the trifecta dive, which I actually searched up to see if it was a real thing, but then I realized halfway through that falling to your death probably isn't a circus trick. With the help of Lumen, they stick the landing. Larry manages to stick the landing too, and he's still pretty pissed at Lumen for abandoning the park, but Lumen shuts this petty jerk down and we battle it out. Larry is strong, full party poison and magic spells and powerful magic of all sorts that can deal well over half health, so you basically want to keep everyone full. Throughout the fight, we're forced to play a memory guessing game, which involves choosing the correct card after it gets swapped around, doing so giving your party a very small heal. I don't know what happens if you miss it, but I hope it's an instant game over because nobody should be messing this up. Although it does get harder throughout the fight. The final one is pretty cute as you have to keep it in mind where the card is as Larry monologues some rather interesting dialogue and potentially character developing to the point where you might lose track of the card just thinking about whether or not he's serious. But with that, Larry is defeated. Lumen cuts to the point saying we're all tired of Larry's games and quite honestly wasting of our time. We're here to put the world together, are you going to help out or continue being spiteful trash? Larry gives in and mentions a certain facility that Lumen's father worked in that potentially has some sort of power that could shape the world. He leads us to a lift that would take us to the facility under the park. We say our farewells, but not without Larry giving one last message to Lumen. Lumen can be proud that he went off to do what he wanted. Obviously everybody wants that in life, that freedom. But it's that irresponsible freedom he found in himself that ended up causing others to suffer. This statement hits hard, and I honestly found myself thinking about it a bit. A lot of people never think about the effects of others when they make choices within themselves. Just because you can run away from something and have it be gone from your mind, doesn't mean that there won't be people who have to pick up where you left off. People that end up altering their course to accommodate for the choices that you made. Which is something I can relate to as I myself am quite the runner. But I guess the thing is, is that if you don't look back, you never have to think about the consequences. I suppose after thinking about what Larry said for quite a bit, I kinda came to a conclusion. Shut up, Larry. Yeah, you heard me. Screw off with the guilt trip garbage. You weren't forced to do anything. You chose this. So what gives you the right to be a petty, spiteful scumbag when Lumen shows up? Larry could have done anything to this place. If he wanted to hold the place down, he could have transformed the park into whatever he wanted if he was tired of it. He could have found another way. Hell, there was someone selling trash that apparently was popping off, so there was probably something you could have done that would have worked. 
but who knows i'm a very irresponsible person but i value free will and doing what you want above all else so i side with lumen all the way and i think larry should have done what he wanted Although I know with my mindset, if everybody had the free will to do whatever they wanted, the economy and society itself would likely collapse, so maybe there always will be people who need to suffer in order for others to be happy. Which is a really depressing thought. I know I'm staying on this for quite a bit, but that's because despite not having anything to do with the main plot of putting the world together, I think Larry is one of the most interesting and well-written characters. He's clearly not a bad guy. He sacrificed 20 years of his life to keep the amusement park up and running, to protect the memory of the previous owner, and yeah, he got screwed over for making the good choice. And I guess in some ways, it sucks because he got stuck on a chunk of Soma that is literally just the park. There is nothing to see but this hellhole. But it's not like Lumen was having any better of a time being stuck on a ship for 20 years. And for him to come back now with the seemingly far more important and overshadowing job of putting the world together, that must really suck to be Larry. Maybe in the end he's not very relevant to the overarching plot, but I think he is relevant to the overarching theme of this game, which I'll get to later. Alright, so I got this box armor, yeah? And I actually thought it was amazing at first, because I took the description of resist debuffs to mean no more status effects, baby! And I'm like, wow, what a steal! But as it turns out, it only resists things like stat downs. I only realized this like hours after having it equipped, and it gives them very poor defensive stats. So needless to say, Lumen, I'm sorry, but at least your stats won't get lowered. Anyways, we enter this long forgotten abandoned facility belonging to Lumen's father. Lumen gets interrupted however as the person from earlier shows up and joins us on the ride. Which honestly is pretty suspicious, like at this point you're stepping on private property, you came here for the circus right? What business do you have here? Nobody questions it though as the group, impressed with Lumen's skills, discusses what it's like to be good at something, with Zero wishing that they could find something that they could be good at. It's a pretty heartfelt conversation, but it gets kinda awkward when our top-hatted friend chimes in. Yeah sure what you're saying might be correct, but gosh golly you really didn't need to just butt in on a conversation you had no part of. And considering you're planning on hurting Zero, it just makes things even weirder for the player that does know this. How genuine are you truly being? They take their leave and we follow. It's here we learn that the facility was made to produce robots, and the purpose of the amusement park was to fund and keep the place standing. Lumen has no idea what the point of these robots are, with his father just being into robotics, and only ever said it was for the good of everyone, including Lumen, which seems in particular to upset him. Before we can get any more insight from Lumen, a scuffle interrupts the crew between that person that has quite frankly been stalking us, and a guard. It's here that he reveals himself to be aligned with the professor in Alpha, with his name being Beta. He knocks out the guard, and Ouch. moves with the intention of holding the power inside to shape the world hostage, unless if Zero comes in and faces him. But of course before he does that he has to waste our time to come on, no not the bridge please, and there it goes. Alright, let's get to work. This dungeon has a pretty fun mechanic of these gears you can press switches to turn, opening up new paths and ways to clear other switches. Is it a mechanic or a gimmick? I feel like gimmick nowadays has such an unnecessary negative stigma attached to it, you know? There's also some conveyor belt fun times too. If you watched my video about Brave Hero Yusha, you might remember this gear mechanic from the Soma Spirits post game dungeon, and as typical of this game, it takes that idea and adds more on top of it, while still being different, not having the world switching of Soma Spirits, but having several colors of gears to manage, with some having different shaped paths. Wait, what's that? Why was I talking about Soma Spirits post game dungeon in a video about Brave Hero Yusha? Uh, well, you know what? No more questions, alright? Y'all are getting way too curious. Ask one more question, and I might cry. You may have also noticed that I have a ton of drinks in my inventory by now. These increase a character's max stats, and as you can clearly see, I have no idea what to do with them or who to get them to. Usually I give them to my favorite character, or the main character, but it's hard to tell with this game because everyone feels kind of like the main character, in the way that they aren't going to leave the party for half the game or something wild like that. And at the moment, they're all kind of my favorite character. So I'm just gonna hold on to these for now, though I did eye them carefully throughout the game, because items have a carrying capacity of 10, and I didn't want to lose these potentially extremely helpful items that I may never actually use. Huh. 
anyways oh my god oh my god oh my god it's him it's him this dude has been haunting me for so for too long get a load of this dude the oozy prince can you believe that super rare enemy i swear i've encountered this guy in every torch 60 game he's in and he always gives me the slip what happens when you beat him i don't know I may never know. Could you imagine how different my life would be if I defeated an Uzi print in a Torch 60 game? Immaculate! Despite the place being abandoned, there are still a ton of people seemingly living here. We even go to a celebration to Jerry, who hasn't had an accident in 6 days. Hey, nice stuff Jerry. We're told that the reason a lot of people here still have their jobs is thanks to Lumen, who a long time ago apparently got a new body? He doesn't elaborate on this as we continue deeper, being blocked off by a lock person that we can't defeat until we have some attacks that attack all enemies. We luckily get these skills not too far later from Funky Fire, who might have the best animated background in the game. While Zero and Lumen get attacks that strike everyone, Rekka gets one called Cleave that strikes a random target twice, and if stalling with Poison and Pulse wasn't strong enough for you, the damage you can get with Cleave is on a level of its own. We make it past the guard and restore the bridge, where we talk to Beta. Beta reveals that he has the orb that we came for, alongside name dropping a certain Professor M. Lumen tells the group that when he was younger, his father put him in a mechanical body because he was too much of a weakling, which is why Lumen dislikes his father. He further explains that his father worked for a man known as Professor M to accomplish this, and makes the assumption that the Professor Alpha and Beta are working under is the same Professor M from all those years ago. I guess the whole body replacement thing is kinda effed up, but I don't know, if I had the choice to become fully roboticized then I'd take that any second of the day, as long as I get to be a cute robot too. But no time for screwing around, it's time to cross that bridge and slap Beta so hard that he's gonna start looking like early access. Yeah I don't know why I put that in the script either. We catch up to Beta, but before we can fight him, he corrupts another robot, leading us to fight a boss known as the Dread Driller. Surrounding them are two batteries that power up their attacks and defenses respectively. While these batteries have normal health, in reality you can knock them out by attacking them three times, but they do come back after a few turns. So now is a better time than ever to have characters that can attack everyone with their skills, which considering Rekka's cleave can't hit all three, she might be the best choice for support. I don't know how well damage over time works on the two batteries, I think I remember trying it with pulse and it didn't work. But what is important is that you at least take out the attack battery, because with it up, your party members can get hit hard, to the point where it may have been safer to roll two supports, because when everyone is getting struck, healing one at a time isn't looking too fashionable. And there are items that heal the whole party, albeit pricing. Your attacks can be countered too, but as long as you're paying attention you should be fine. One thing I haven't mentioned is that sigil skills seem to ignore counter shields, stuff like drain and pulse. So with the power of the big brain inside me, we defeat the driller and make our way to do the same to Beta. Beta explains that the professor gave him a second chance at life with the condition being of helping Zero awaken, which is exactly what he plans to do, and the battle begins. I'll be honest, this dude is kind of a jerk, but the salmon colored top hat and bow are pretty cute. This is definitely part of the game where the debuffs become more apparent, stuff like lowering power and magic attack, alongside things such as reducing your healing. Luckily I still have the cardboard box on Lumen, because a character getting hit by both an attack and magic attack down basically takes away their offense. Unlike a lot of the bosses in this game, Beta's defense and magic defense stats are different from one another, in which case he has a lot more magic defense when compared to physical defense. I rolled with Book Lumen giving him high magic attack, but even getting a crit on his magic skills did very little damage compared to Rekka's physical attacks. Also at one point, Zero got hit by a spell that damaged them to the exact health that they had remaining, which is really unfortunate, but pretty funny too. All I had to do was give them one special defense strength, but I'm just too indecisive. While it's still worth it to debuff him, Beta does have the ability to wipe all debuffs and status effects on himself. If that wasn't enough, he has the ability to drain your HP a pretty decent amount too. If you've been trying to cheese with poison pull stalling, this is when you're going to realize that stuff just isn't always going to work. And while it's important to note that he has less defense than magic defense, he can counter physical attacks at times, so be sure to check the combat log to know when his counter shield goes away. Much like the fight with Alpha beforehand, halfway through the fight, Beta transforms, insinuating that this is the power that Zero could have if they were to awaken. And I'm not sure how, 
but the fact that he's now wearing a crown with the beta letter on it is arguably even cuter than the top hat. The scythe wings are pretty cool too, matching up with his scythe. But it's not just for show, his skill Shock Reaper is powerful. Like you can only imagine my reaction when I got hit by it. Much like Alpha, he also has the ability to swap everyone's roles. This part of the fight is significantly more brutal than the first form. Keeping your MP in check gets harder as Beta has skills to make everyone's abilities cost double the MP. And that's if you even have any MP at all by this point. Long fights like these are why I'm glad I typically had the Wish and Siphon sigils equipped. This fight is oppressive as hell. If it's not Beta dealing enough damage to make me scream in fear, it's debuffing your characters to the point where you might as well just switch them to support. If you haven't bought one yet, there is a quick ring that you can find in the dungeon, which increasing speed may be more useful than you think, considering Beta currently outsped my whole party. Though maybe using Lumen's speed down skill would have helped. Sometimes I forget to think. These things happen. But we defeat him. As he tells Zero the purpose that they've been looking for is to awaken. He compliments Professor M's ability to infuse life into anything, relinquishing the orb, urging us to go to the next room for any answers, and leaves. In the next room, we find a computer with details of the reconstruction project headed by Sherman Foss, Lumen's father. It's here we learn the truth of the matter. When Lumen was young, he was gravely injured at the factory, to the point where it was unsure if he was going to survive. His father sought out Professor M in order to infuse Lumen into a new body in order to give him a second chance at life. This procedure was so expensive that the theme park had to be built in order to cover the cost. But it was this event that awoke something in Lumen's father, the ability to help others as well. I may be interpreting this incorrectly, but I believe that this is a body replacement center? Like, that's the point of all these robots we saw being made, they were bodies to help save others? And so, the people we saw here were people who got their bodies transformed, which is why they thanked Lumen, because without him being injured and getting a new body, they might have never gotten a second chance either. I think I'm right on this? Regardless, Lumen, now understanding his father didn't hate him, and everything from the theme park to the factory was made for him, is unsure of what to do. Much like with Rekka before him, the orb calls, and it's time for Lumen to make his decision, to put something on his horizon. Destiny. I want to fulfill my father's wishes to spread happiness. Freedom. I want to continue helping people in my own way. I'm gonna be honest, if you chose Destiny, then quite frankly, we come from different worldviews. Lumen isn't his father, so cut the generational follow in his footsteps crap. Lumen is himself, and he chose to leave all this behind in order to become what he wanted to be, a doctor. And dare I say by this point he's shown himself off to be a pretty darn good one. And to make him abandon his dreams and all of this hard work for the dream of another, under some obligation that now he has to drag himself back to this hellish place he ran away from? To be quite honest, I think that's sickening. So freedom, baby. It wasn't even a hard choice. Lumen wonders if all this happened for a reason, that we specifically found this place in Soma, and farther ponders on why such a powerful object was here to begin with. We read one more log from Chairman Foss, detailing a call he got from Professor M, who found an artifact of the Sun King powerful enough to move worlds, powerful enough to bring back the spirits. The professor told Foss to head to Boreal Bastion, which begins what is known as the Soul Project. Zero wonders what this all means as Beta shows up once more attacking Zero. Zero once again gets a vision of absolution as they transform. With full infuriation once more, they state that they hate everything, from the journey, this place, to the very friends that they've been traveling with. Everything goes red as they yell out in wonder of who they are. Ending Chapter 2 we're back in time with Bright. He's planning on going on another adventure with Sylvia and Rosen, but he still has something he has to do. Still holding that darn mask, the two head back to the forest. Where get this, my man Mason shows up. Hey Mason, what's up? Mason is a returning character from Soma Spirits. He's pretty chill. Pun intended because you meet him in the ice place. Anyways, Bright is here to thank Elder Oakley, so we split from Mason. We learned that Bright managed to get his friends out when they were in the forest, but they didn't really get to explore as a team. The Elder encourages Bright to have more faith in his friends and to not make decisions for them. 
I don't know if Bright really gets this message well. In fact, I don't think he understands that his way of thinking of getting friends more as collectibles to accomplish more is a way of thinking that could be potentially challenged. Meanwhile, the mask tells Bright to keep it hidden away, which you can probably see why when as soon as Bright leaves, Mason shows up telling Oakley that the mask has been taken. And I mean, Mason. If you knew where the mask was, buddy, you could have just destroyed the key, hit it better, hell, carried it on you. I understand that this powerful mask can do some helpful stuff, but we all know what's gonna happen to Soma soon. You screwed everybody! Bright and gang goes to this random as hell mansion that I guess has always been there but nobody questioned. The front door is sealed by magic and Bright, using the powers brought forth, simply imagines the door opening, and to the amazement of his friends, it worked. They enter in and come across another door with a comically large lock, and the mask doesn't want Bright to destroy himself trying to open it. So we're gonna have to be traditional, going around, solving puzzles, and finding a way- OH MY GOD! Ah, uh, It's- It's- Yeah, these Narsh security system BS follow the light type beats. Yeah, that! The Narsh security system BS follow the light type beats! I thought I got away from you at home! Why are you following me? Okay, okay, okay. Let's all calm down, especially you all, you're getting way too rowdy, cool it. This puzzle isn't nearly as bad as the ones in home, though. In fact, it gets easier every time you fail it. I'm not gonna show you how many times I failed it, we're, we're moving on. There's some pretty neat puzzles in here, I always wonder how some of this stuff is done in RPG Maker. And while Bright may have lost the power to board, his mask helps him out a lot. We see Bright begin to get used to and enjoy the power to get what he wants more and more as he uses the mask. We also learn through diary logs a story between two family members that once lived here, brother and sister, and their growing disagreements between their two different outlooks on life and how they should spend their fortune to change the world, with the brother going out to freely explore, leaving his sister destined to do all the work for him. Going underground, we actually find the room of the brother, where we get a sizable key for the sizable lock at the entrance. Ironically, Rosen even thanks the portrait of the brother. This is pretty funny due to a lot of specific events that will be occurring in the future. It will make sense by the end of the game. We break the lock on the big door, leaving Bright to unseal it with his powers, but he can't do it, and begins to get frustrated as he continually strikes the door, with his friends getting worried. Seemingly using the power of his intense anger towards the door, he manages to unseal the magic. His friends are still worried, but he seems fine, albeit starting to give off some bad vibes. But beyond this door is like, a courtyard, where I remember saying to myself, even now as I see the footage again, why would they build another castle in a castle? <laughs> Regardless, we go inside and we see a statue of the sister and, uh, a rather certain room. Yo, this is the room from Soma Spirits. Y'all got me messed up. This is where you get the orbs and oh my, wowie. The group isn't very impressed with this room like I am, with Bright even being angry at the nothingness. This is when the mask reveals itself to the group. The mask reminds Bright that it said that it could make Bright a king, and that this could be his castle. His friends get pretty bad vibes from this all, but Bright reminds them of when they got lost in the force and says that he could make it so he could never lose anyone again, bringing the world together to support each other. I guess this is what happens when you give a little kid too much power. The mask gives Bright the ability to shape the world, to infuse life into itself. Bright excitedly begins to use his power to shape the world as he pleases. Mason, understanding that the whole world is about to get screwed the hell over, shows up to the entrance of the place but is too late as he watches the castle being erected in front of him. The four now stand on top of the castle. Funnily enough, I think this place is the end of Soma Spirits. It's here the mask compares Bright to the sun, watching over everyone and giving them his warmth. And Bright declares himself as the Sun King. Silvio and Rosa make up a good point that this is all pretty sudden, and seems like a lot of work, but Bright seems very adamant about never losing anyone again and convinces his friends, and everyone celebrates. Yikes. Meanwhile, from the statue of the sister, a pink orb forms, and from the statue of the brother, a blue one. Do I need to tell you who these two are, or whatever, let's just act like we don't know. Uh, <laughs> who could these strange orbos be? We'll have to find out later, but I bet that blue one has a pretty cool fight theme. 
We return back to the coolers on the Virtue late at night as we see Zero once again looking out at the stars. Rekka checks in on them but Zero kinda just gives a rather rude cold shouldering. Zero thinks about the dreams they had about Bright that we just witnessed ourselves and just having too much on their mind to sleep. They plan on heading to the Garden Dome to help alleviate their thoughts. I guess it's pretty late at night, but I kinda wonder how they're able to tell the time after 20 years of this. I don't see any clocks. I mean, I guess there's a clock in Dockington, but I don't think he has any hands. He, like, on his face. Face hands. This is definitely one of my favorite parts of the game though, because it really feels like you're going on a tired night stroll, with others up just thinking about how weird everything has been lately. We go around talk to the crew, get some items, and finally get my hands on that XP up upgrade on the skill tree, which begins to cement me as becoming likely higher level than intended as the game goes on. I really appreciate how much extra dialogue there is here that you have to go out of your way to see. Most players probably wouldn't bother going to the third floor and stuff, probably just heading straight to the garden dome. Which after doing all this we finally go there as well. Zero begins to think in frustrated confusion towards everything that has happened so far. The need to bring back spirits, what Alpha and Beta are trying to do to them, to absolution itself. As expected of every darn time we head to the garden dome, the shadow monsters spawn forth. But guess what? In the coolest moment of the game, hands down, Zero, tired of everything, turns around towards the monsters and says, try me. Oh snap, try me? Aw uh, hell yeah, let's go Zero. And let me tell you, what proceeds is a total beatdown. Zero destroys these guys. Once afraid of these things and needing their friends to fight them off, now Zero is there having no fear towards the shadow spawn and being able to solo them, it's awesome! And a part of me likes to think that Zero came here on purpose because they know that these monsters would show up and just wanted to be there to let their anger out, like, alright, let's hit the gym. I love Zero, god this part is so cool. Anyways, the shadow spawn disappears as the captain shows up. The two watch the stars and talk. Guidance thanks Zero for all that they have done, but Zero feels ambivalent, stating that they're afraid to go on these adventures now, being attacked by these dark beings, the mention of absolution. Zero is still lost on why all this is happening to them. Guidance isn't sure what to say. He's truly thankful for all Zero has done for everyone on the ship, who have spent their entire lives seeing nothing but stars. He asks if the burden is too much for Zero, and if they want to step down, but Zero just isn't sure and they decide to hold off on the answer until tomorrow. On the way back to their room, Zero runs into Lumen. He discusses the choice he made back at the factory, and how he needs to have faith in others to grow. To trust people to find their own happiness, much like how he found his own being a doctor. Zero is glad that Lumen could figure that out and wishes that they could understand their self more. As they split off, Zero tries to apologize for what they said back at the factory, but Lumen kind of just doesn't accept it and leaves. Okay. Also, probably one of the funniest bits in the game, you talk to this freezy looking rock homie saying that they were just going to the room as we begin to talk to Lumen, and after the convo, you can just see them laying outside of their room because their key got bent. Going to sleep? We're back in the dream world, where we meet our orb friend once more, who once again states that they had to pull Zero out of their state when they transformed back at the factory. We view the horizon once more, seeing that object getting even closer, and maybe with just one more adventure, we'll be able to touch what's on Zero's horizon. The orb asks Zero if they've ever done something that they'd regret for the rest of their life, which Zero is just like, uh, no, before telling Zero that they can help them with bringing that object closer telling Zero to just think of anywhere they want to be, and they can take them there. Waking up, Zero does just that, referencing the log they read about Professor M's potential location, Zero thinks about Boreal Bastion, and god dang it, it actually works! You may have noticed that every time we encountered a piece of Soma, we saw the orb beforehand, meaning that this hasn't been a coincidence at all. Zero doesn't question this power that they've been shown and goes to Guidance. On the way, collecting an odd keycard someone on the ship must have slipped under their door. I'm not gonna lie, I saw the keycard, and I was like, ah, keycard, 
factory and I headed back to the factory. Once again, there's no point in revisiting areas. There's nothing for you here. We're told to explore the Boreal Bastion. When asked if they want to keep doing this, Zero makes a decision to go there, saying they want to understand everything that has been happening to them, and most important, to find out what their purpose is. They ask their friends if they want to help, and honestly the response is oddly reluctant. Oh well, I guess we should get equipped before we- OH MY GOD! CARDBOARD BOB! YOU'VE BEEN TURNED INTO A MARKETABLE PLUSHIE! No, I think I'll set you on this table. Nice! And I know what you're thinking, Spacey, can you just shut up and get this crap done? And, and listen, if you're thinking about falling asleep or dipping out, well just know that we're approaching the best parts of the game. Characters are going to be changing and the twists are going to be twisty. What the hell does that even mean Spacey, god I'm tired. So now more than ever, let's check Boreal Bastion out. As we land, we get to view Professor M in a group call with Alpha and Beta as they discuss the awakening of Zero. Professor M switches lines as we're introduced to the next jerk who's going to try to awaken Zero. And man, I can't wait to talk about them. We land off in the railway, as it was too cold to land at the top. Sorry for any potential ghost frames here, my computer was struggling and I couldn't get 60 FPS footage, which ends up happening for most of the end game. It sucks and I wish I had a better computer, so that my videos would stop being permanently tainted like this. But you know what, we're gonna make it through, okay? Let's act like the ghost frames are here because Halloween is coming, and trust me, these ghosts scare me too. Unfortunately for us at the train station, the train to Boreal Bastion is blocked off due to several tunnel gates we need to go around and open. I'll be honest, I kinda just ignored the map and explored around on my own. I got lost for like 20 minutes, but this game is so much fun I didn't really care. Despite what the game may have predicted upon my thoughts, I actually enjoyed this dungeon. It's very chill to just walk around. I actually thought the tile set work was pretty impressive. I'm not sure why, but something about it was subconsciously noticeable when compared to the other maps in this game, to the point where I still remember to mention it now. No idea. Maybe it's like the angles and the diagonal areas, I'm not sure, but I just appreciate the detail on this one. There's also this clan person here that wants us to collect hermit crabs to eat, which is kind of messed up, like what if these hermit crabs are as anthropomorphized as you? Funnily enough, a reward for doing this is that we get freaking step mine, yeah? It's not actually called step mine, but it's a sigil that does more damage depending on how many steps you've taken throughout the game. But there isn't any way to check how many steps you've taken, and I kinda never bothered using it and basically took it as a punchline to a joke that I thought was pretty funny. Who knows, maybe I could have set up a macro to move up and down and went to sleep over day or night, but I don't know. I already do that when it comes to rendering these videos, and doing that honestly might have been the finishing blow for this dying computer. So I'll keep this strategy in mind for if I ever do a Torch 60 hard mode no XP marathon stream. Just imagine people pouring in to watch me play Soma Union. I'm at this part and I'm just like, alright everybody, I need to charge up that step mine. I'ma set up the macro, go to sleep, you can keep watching if you want, I'll catch y'all in a few hours. Anyways, after making a bit of progress with opening the tunnel gates, we're told to take a break in, well, the break room. And this leads to a scene that actually kind of pisses me off a bit. Okay, okay. So everyone's chilling out with Zero talking with anxious anticipation of finally being able to understand themselves, which nobody seems to care about. Zero asks Rekka if she's okay, and no, she's not. Lumen asks Zero about what they talked about earlier, of how Zero should owe up to what they said. But Zero instead says that they were hoping that they could put this all behind them. Rekka freaking snaps at that. Despite her constantly feeling bad about how Zero is treated by the captain, she flips the switch and gets mad that Zero won't take back what they said, thinking it was this newfound praise from the captain causing Zero to become conceited. Zero clearly states the obvious that they didn't mean what they said, and that clearly wasn't them. And I don't know what the hell Rekka is on. Zero continues to go through very good points that they are going through some pretty rough stuff right now, and Rekka just storms out. Lumen walks out too, which you know what, for being the oldest one here, he sure is looking immature right now. Okay, let me explain why this scene gets me so heated. Zero is completely justified in their actions in every way. They spent their entire life having no idea of their purpose, while constantly being told that all spirits have a purpose. 
And throughout this journey, they witness their friends understanding themselves and their purposes, and isn't even jealous of them. They're happy for them, even though they've been wanting to know their purpose more than anything else. So when they finally get the chance to potentially understand that, alongside all these new questions, Rekka gets mad? Like dang Rekka, we played along with you when you forced everyone to do the crappy war stuff back in the jungle, back when you were trying to understand your purpose. And I know, Rekka and Lumen are mad that Zero said they hated them in this journey. One, obviously that wasn't Zero speaking in a stable mindset. Two, do you have any idea what Zero is going through? They learn their species is trying to be resurrected, that nobody on their planet knows what they are. They're being singly targeted by a group of people that want to fight them in hopes of awakening them. They have spent their entire life just asking questions and being confused. You know how lonely that must feel? Instead of just getting mad and walking out because Zero said they hated them, how about you ask Zero if they're okay? Don't get mad at them for saying what they said, instead ask them why they said it. Try to understand your friend, you've been on the same small as hell ship for 20 years, the least you can do is try to understand why they said that. Zero needs support now more than ever, so how about you be a good friend and help them? They're scared. They were there for you two, you know. And I thought you two made the decision to have faith in others and help them find their happiness, but nope, let's just walk out. And also, where the hell are you two going? We are on a mission to bring the world together. What are you going to do? Go back to the ship and tell the captain you're done with restoring the world because Zero's a meanie? Going to put the chance of restoring the whole entire world in peril because of some petty as hell reason? Spend your entire life searching for Soma, time finally comes, and you get mad because Zero let off some steam in a very heated moment after being assaulted? Alright. Alright, okay. Screw you two. <laughs> Y'all are petty as hell. Like Lumen, you act like you haven't said rude things to Zero and Rekka right in front of them, and we've been dealing with your negative butt this whole journey. Nah, put that gif away. We're done with that crap. But I guess Rekka didn't have a problem with that attitude, huh? Oh my god. Okay, maybe I'm just going too deep into this, you know? But I just feel like the game's making Zero seem like the bad person here. Zero, rightfully mad, punches out a bookcase, revealing a hidden room behind the wall, which... Huh. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Cool, let's see what's behind there. We find what seems to be a place detailing the events of the Sun King's rise and fall. Is that what happened in Soma Spirits? I thought Heart and Soul just woke up, went to the Sun King's castle, slapped him... Ouch! <laughs> slapped form in dissonance and then went back home to fall asleep. I guess my memory's a little bit rough. Oh yeah, we also meet this ghost archaeologist who seems to be quite the Sun King fanatic. I wonder how they got down here. Maybe they punched out a different bookcase somewhere. At the end of this museum? Art gallery? We find a picture of the final boss of Soma Spears. Looking at this picture, Zero's mind thinks of absolution. Lumen and Rekka show up once more, it makes me wonder why they even left in the first place. Zero states that this is Absolution, a being of pure malaise. While it may have been defeated by heart and soul over a hundred years ago, it still rings in Zero's mind, meaning it still somehow exists. The group all wonders about this, with Zero restating that they just want to understand what is happening to them. The ghost from earlier shows up, revealing themselves as Professor Ruby, and starts getting mad that all the commotion we're making is going to cause these pictures to fall down and get destroyed. Then they even fight us like this isn't going to cause even more noise. Yeah, okay, you got it. Ruby is surrounded by two sentry vets that upon losing all HP get fully healed by Ruby, who has a heal all skill. So they're undefeatable, and the game actually tells you this after trying to knock them out multiple times. I would show you this, but what do you think I am? Some silly stupid that doesn't understand how the boss mechanics work? You think I just ran my head in a wall until the game told me to stop? Well if you thought that, then you're correct. We defeat Ruby and learn how to cure all ourselves, meaning I can finally stop stuffing everyone's faces with these muffin boxes. God I need to start using these drink items soon. We head back up and continue working towards opening all the gates, where upon doing so we can finally go to Boreal Bastion. We board the train with Ruby. Zero is thinking about Absolution while Rekka tries to come in with the apology, but what Rekka forgot was that this is an RPG. And like any great RPG, if there is a rideable train, there has to be a fight on it, leading us to a fight against the Rain Conductor, which I think is a pretty funny name, but by the end of this fight, they're gonna learn that I'm the Pain Conductor. It's okay to unsub now. 
The boss is constantly summoning little sparky homies named Conductites. Take them out while you can or you're just gonna get swarmed, and the Conductor can buff them too if you leave them out for too long, making them even harder to take out. You have Cure Us now, so the game kind of just became a lot easier as you can now heal everybody. I actually went offensive with Zero, which is moderately surprising because if you haven't noticed by now, in most of my footage, Zero is support. I just found that they didn't have the power that Wrecker or Lumen had. You could even say I couldn't find their purpose either. But this boss, much like the enemies in this dungeon, are weak to Zero's Gale spells, so I had some fun with offensive Zero here. Zero also has the best skill when it comes to attacking everyone, which is helpful too. So I guess in the end, most of my damage came from poison plus pulse combo, it's that strong. With the boss defeated, we reach our destination. Well, not really. We have a small force to go through before we can reach the Bastion. Everyone apologized to each other, except for Lumen, which, you know, what, whatever. Everything is fine again, I guess. We get a really pretty view of the Bastion, realizing we're gonna have to take a pretty long way around just to get there. We split off with Ruby, who hopes to explore their great grandfather's mansion when we put the world together, which I think might be a reference to that ghost dude from Soma Spirits. I remember that there was a ghost guy stuck in a mansion, with us making the choice of whether he should pass on or not. I don't know. Maybe that wasn't the intention because I don't, I, I don't know. Should Ruby move on too? They seem to be having a good time. Anyways, it's time to get going. So let me tell ya, Agent Ape. He does some good snow themed music. One of my favorite songs from Soma Spirits was Stay Frosty Friend, and this song is great too. All I'm saying is that if I'm somehow stuck in a snowy forest in real life, I'm gonna need Agent Ape there with me to compose some jams. In fact, out of all the areas in this game, this one gives me the most Soma Spirits vibe. It's a hard thing to explain, I'll get to it later, but it probably adds to why I like this part so much. Also, I love this ice sliding puzzle leading into this joke about ice puzzles. Oh, okay, this is the only one in the game, alright? Okay. And then like 5 seconds later we're here, but these are ice puzzles with obstacles though. Big difference. And really, it is. Using timing to dodge the enemies as you go around and get the keys is pretty fun. I always like these key collecting rooms. Things begin to get harder to see as the snow picks up and we go deeper. The area becomes a little more maze-like too, making me feel like I probably missed some items. Also. The Globe Guitarist, wowie. The gang begins to get swallowed by the coldness as a mysterious figure shows up. The group is then knocked out. We have a quick talk with the orb as they state that Zero shouldn't be so reckless and that they're putting their friends in danger. And I agree, Zero not turning back here is an actual dick move. <laughs> the orb says that Zero needs to make decisions as a team because even though that they're the leader, they can't get anything done unless everyone is in it together. It's very reminiscent to what Oakley told Bright. Luckily the group does survive and wakes up in a log cabin where we find out who our rescuer is. This green dude with a mask who we saw in the video call earlier. This is Gamma. And unlike Alpha and Beta, he's more here to give a warm welcome than to hurt Zero. He confirms that we are meeting Professor M soon and has apparently been with him long enough to know Chairman Foss as well. He asks us to meet him there and teleports away. Man. I wish I had a teleport skill. Really? It would have made the time waste with backtracking to the previous areas make me not feel as silly. We sled our way down and make it to the Bastion, where we fight the Forecast Golem. This boss changes between a lot of different forms, each with their own resistances and weaknesses, so you should ideally use the Inspect Sigil to try and identify these. And if you don't have the Inspect Sigil equipped, then I don't, I don't know, die. Although if it makes you feel better, I didn't bother inspecting all the different forms, I just used different skills and got lucky. No brain, big gain, baby. It's kind of incredible how much damage enemies do in hard mode. We're actually at the point of the game that if you haven't upgraded your curing spells yet on the star chart, then you might actually start struggling to heal your party back to safe HP, so I say grab those as soon as you can. Gamma congratulates us on our victory. You know you could have helped, man. He urges us to follow in order to learn the answers of everything, encouraging us by saying that the professor can help the group restore Soma. We cut back in time to the Sun King, now in the time where he has full control, all grown up. We explore the castle, meeting up with Rosen and Silvio. It's funny to think that the Sun King brought the world of Soma together, which is kind of what the main cast is doing as well, except in a more literal sense I suppose. Rosen and Silvio are both rather unhappy at the state of things. Bright is confused by the fact that his friends aren't happy, while the match tries to convince them that he's right and his friends are just wrong. 
A sudden shaking arouses the suspicion as everyone as we go to see what happened. We see the door to that one very certain room open up. It's here the two encounter the pink orb from earlier. She says she's watched the Sun King rise in power over the past 10 years and asks the king for help in order to make the world happier. However, her lies are carved out by the blue orb, her brother. While the pink orb seeks to create a world where everyone is mindlessly happy, the blue orb seeks to create one of self-awareness. They both badger the Sun King for his powers, who denies them both, attacking them. He puts on the mask and attacks them once more, sending them away. Rosen and Sylvia shows up and the mask even tries to get them killed too, but the Sun King manages to tell them to get out of the way. The two decide to leave the Sun King for good, asking what good bringing the world together is if you have to use such a horrible power. The Sun King, now angry at the mask and realizing it's actually pretty terrible, says he's done with being a king. But the mask says that if he leaves now, someone else will take his power, such as those two orbs. When asked just what it is, the mask reveals himself as a being that can make every wish and dream come true. It is absolution. And it wants nothing more than to bring Soma into a state of pure singularity. Nothing. And the Sun King has no choice but to stay with the mask if he doesn't want someone else taking the power and potentially doing even worse than him with it. Unsure of what to do, he is told that he has a visitor waiting for him in the throne room. Hey, my man Mason. He acts very kind towards the Sun King and gives him a gift and a replica of the mask. It's very clear he's actually really upset at everything that has happened and is attempting to fix things, knowing that the power is not coming from the Sun King rather than the mask he's wearing. Before leaving, he urges the Sun King to talk to Elder Oakley once more, as it has been 10 years since, which he obliges. The Sun King once again comes to Oakley for guidance. He thought he brought the world together to be happy, but now everyone is unhappy. Oakley, being the MVP of Soma quite honestly, tells the Sun King that this isn't what the Sun King wanted. People aren't happy because everyone is living in one place. The Sun King made the decisions he wanted rather than the ones that the people he wanted to make happy wanted. The Sun King recounts his mistakes and wonders just what he should do. To which Oakley responds with, Taking responsibility. The Sun King made decisions for everyone, thinking he knew what they wanted, when really he should have believed in his friends as his friends believed in him. On cue, Silvio and Rosen show up, telling Bright that everyone in the world is fighting each other right now. The group runs back as things fade to Zero, who is once more seeing all of this. Alright, let's enter this place and find out the truth. Though, I guess we should go back to the Virtue first to get some equipment, and while we're here we- OH MY GOD! THE PUPPETEER! I think I'll place you over here. Don't do anything stupid now. I mean it. Back at the Bastion, we take an elevator as Zero wonders why the Professor and his lackeys would give up the power to restore Soma so easily. And Lumen kinda has it down when he says that we're probably just about to get screwed. But I guess the truth comes at a cost. We enter the Lurid Laboratory, where Gamma encourages us to explore around and discover just what occurred here. Listen. Literally, listen. Remember how I said how much I love that song from Soma Spirits, Stay Frosty Friend? Well the song that plays here, Professor M's theme, it has hints of that song in it. It's like a different version of it and it is so good. I was going to make a running gag where I would continuously say that every new amazing song I listened to was the best song in the game, and you can be sure I would have said it here. There's likely more throwbackish songs here too, because there's quite a bit of Soma Spirits callbacks coming up, and golly I'm getting happy just thinking about it. I mean, let's just say that there's a reason that this is Professor M's theme. Pretty fun place too, you ride around on these cards which I think happen in Crescent Prism too, and there's a mini boss at one point against this really cute robot that I love so much. They also have star magic which I guess adds them to the cool list, but it's by fighting them we learn auras. Auras are an evolution of Rain's turrets from Crescent Prism. You can only have one on at a time, and they have an upkeep cost, in other words they tax your MP every turn. If you don't have the MP to keep the aura up, you lose it. Each character gets a different aura that spreads to the whole party. Zero gives an elemental resist, Rekka gives a damage up, and Lumen gives a region that I personally think is pretty incredible. 
Furthermore, in power form, all characters get Aura Blast, which does more damage depending on how long the aura has been up. So when your aura character is low on MP, you can either heal their MP or consume the aura to do big damage. I only really bothered with auras later on because, as it likely sounds, it's not very relevant outside of boss fights. There's some neat puzzles here too, like get this, there's this one about mixing chemicals and you're supposed to find notes around to help you out. You find this note about a lost key somewhere, and the note said that the owner would take it with them when inspecting the servers, and maybe I just have a kind of lack of knowledge in this type of stuff, but I could not find it, so I assumed, oh there must be a server room somewhere. And I proceeded to go back and explore the area for like 30 minutes. Can you imagine watching me play these games? Eventually, through my passive ability thanks to playing retro first person shooters, wall hump intuition, I managed to find it. So by this point, you might be wondering, why am I still talking? And I don't, I, I can't help you with that one. But you might be wondering where the big story stuff is. And that's where we're going to get into now. I suppose this would be the point of no return, like, play this game if you're interested in it and all that, because the big reveals are coming, though I guess on the other hand, I suppose if you're this far in, you're probably just gonna watch it anyways. So if I can make one small suggestion, to anyone watching this that has made it this far and doesn't plan on playing this game, I don't know, it's just a suggestion, but try supporting this in some way, yeah? Buy the game anyways, it's free, but there's a suggested $5 donation. Or how about drawing some fan art? If you made it this far, surely you must have some attachment to these characters. If anything from a design perspective, have some fun, you know? Alright. We're moving on. Are you all ready? Okay. Throughout the laboratory, we find several logs that explain everything about the Soul Project and answers our questions. These are all written by Chairman Foss, and are thus in his perspective. Continuing from what we read in the factory, Foss arrives in Boreal Bastion to learn of what powers Professor M has found. M reveals the power that was used by the Sun King himself, and it was with this power that the Sun King was able to create spirits that watched over Soma after his fall. So thusly, Professor M wants to use this power to do the same thing that the Sun King did with it, create spirits of his own to benefit and help the world. In return, the Professor will forgive all debt he has put on Foss from giving his son a new body. Zero is shocked to realize that they are a man-made replica, but continues onward regardless, seeking the full story. We learn in the next report after several months, they managed to build a spirit replica prototype. This was Alpha. She is more similar to that of the robots that Foss has built in the past, and was mainly just a test to see if she could contain the Sun King's power. However, Alpha was unable to hold the power, becoming violent and unstable, ultimately being decommissioned. Next up was Beta, who ultimately followed the same fate. We catch up with Gamma as we make it to the third report, a seemingly turning point. And yeah, I can say that my opinion on some characters are about to change. It discusses that of the more organic Gamma, designed to be more similar to that of the spirits that Professor M has met in the past. With the body complete, they once more tested to see if it could hold the Sun King's power. It seemed like it worked, that Gamma could hold some of the Sun King's power, but then Professor M wanted to try to use the entirety of the Sun King's power on Gamma, saying that this will help Gamma awaken. Foss, knowing this was a terrible idea, wanted to back out, but couldn't due to the threat of his debt he owes Professor M, M treating it as a leash that he can always control Foss with. So without choice, they infused Gamma with everything, and the disaster was immediate. As the two witnessed Gamma screaming out in pain, unable to handle the Sun King's power, the Professor stopped the experiment, feeling absolutely no empathy for Gamma. Treating Gamma as just another failure, he continued to strive to make a successful spirit replica. This causes Foss to wonder a very familiar question of what length should we use a terrible power that only seems to cause harm. Despite everything, Gamma still seems to want to be on the side of the professor that tortured him, almost as if he's thankful that the professor gave him a second chance at life. And honestly, I feel like throwing up reading that. We find a notebook before the fourth report, which tells us upon the creation of sigils, 
made to replicate the ability of the original two spirits made by the Sun King, this being heart and soul of course. Though I'll be honest, the spirit skills we get in this game seem way more powerful than what heart and soul got. Refinement I suppose. The fourth report explains Foss venturing into creating mass-produced models of the spirits, these being the spirits seen on the Virtue, the Epsilon models. Ultimately, the professor saw these Epsilon models as unnecessary, and they were to be placed in hibernation until they could complete their current task. This continues on to the fifth report, stating that after two years of failure, they are finally set to work on Project Zeta. Zeta will be a replica like no other, built with inherent magic components to withstand anything. While the professor seems hopeful of using the Sun King's power for good, Foss comes to his own conclusion on whether or not the power has ever been used for good. Confounded and diddly do, those rabble rousers! Sorry, <laughs> what the hell am I doing? Hey, hey, we gotta move on. The sixth report details the overwhelming success of Project Zeta being able to handle the power far more than their successors, also being able to learn and take action in their life, understanding and driving the purpose of their fellow spirits. This seemingly makes Zeta a good friend of everyone. And of course the professor must like him because he can actually handle the full extent of the Sun King's power. The only problem is that upon doing so it alters his complexion to become a being of pure malaise, leaving the professor uncertain of keeping Zeta with these powers. Foss makes the decision to take these powers away from Zeta fearful of what they might do with it, knowing that someday Zeta may stab them in the back for that decision. We meet Gamma once more, who makes the assumption that we plan on helping the professor, which everyone gives a resounding no towards that, as Zero can only see the professor as a horrible person after reading the logs. Gamma suggests just talking to the professor himself, before telling us that he has something he wants to show us. Ah, I see. Gamma takes us to the room where the infusion process took place, where replicas were to be tested to see whether or not they were worthy. It's here Gamma reveals that while Foss called this the Sun King's power, the more proper name of this power was Absolution. Gamma shows this power off by summoning the matter spawn that have been attacking us on the ship, which makes you wonder, how did they get on the ship? Gamma even makes them disappear at his own control. Interesting. Regardless, Gamma challenges us to battle, wanting to show us the fate of those who fail. Oh my god, he's cute. Though maybe his appearance is kinda gross when you consider it was purely made for the wish fulfillment of some sick guy's fantasy of wanting to create replicas of other people that he became obsessed with. Gamma, I love you, you're a cool dude, but you're a slave to a terrible, terrible person. Zero asks Gamma why Absolution is being used when it seems like such a terrible power. To which Gamma responds that it is a terrible power, and he wants it to be stopped, and Zero is the only one that can do that. When asked why, Gamma states that it is simply Zero's purpose, much like how it was his purpose to lead them there. This fight is actually pretty easy for what we're used to by now. He can poison the party easily, but Lumen's aura completely negates poison, even still healing a bit. It just means that you can't be too spendy on Lumen's MP. Even in his second form, he's not too much of a problem. I was probably pretty overleveled by this point. Upon defeat, Gamma tells us that this was never a power anyone wanted. They used it because they were made to use it. And they wouldn't ask Zero to use this power either, if it wasn't for Project Zeta. Gamma congratulates us, deeming us capable, before we hear Professor M requesting us to finally meet him and to get the power to shape the world. The group wonders about this, but are ultimately determined to do this together. Funnily enough, if you return to the Virtue, the group agrees to keep their knowledge on spirit replicas contained for now. Also, remember those drinks that permanently increase your stats? I still hadn't used any yet, but I decided I was sick of playing Support Zero. It's time for the power up of a lifetime. Ah! And this is to go one step beyond! Hey, am I ruining the story pacing with this stupid crap? Regardless, Zero is now by far my best party member. Actually just better than everyone at everything. Which, good. They deserve it. Okay, are you all ready? Let's meet the professor. We wait in anticipation as Zero steps forward with shaky but brave confidence, calling out the professor. 
The professor states that he never thought that he'd see Zero again before revealing himself. Oh my god, it's Mason. Of course, the three don't know who that is. Mason asks what we're after. Lumen replies with the obvious. Mason thanks Lumen for his existence being the catalyst of the Soul Project, made to help everyone. But Rekka counters by saying that the Soul Project didn't help anyone. It's a failure. But Mason states that none of them has any idea of the power that they're dealing with. Rekka is just as clueless as her grandfather. Despite none of them recognizing Mason, it's clear that he is connected to all of them in some way. Being friends with Rekka's grandfather, working alongside Lumen's father, and well, assumedly creating Zero. Mason tells us that Absolution is a terrible power. He recalls his previous failure to hide the power, which honestly he did a pretty crappy job on beforehand. Mason reveals that he has a fragment of Absolution in himself. It was the reason that he was the only one that could save Lumen, which ultimately caused the damage we see on his face, because Absolution is the power to infuse life into things. Mason's life experiences has taught him that the only way to make progress is to have others suffer. He seeks to stop this cycle, but by this point he probably doesn't realize he's accomplishing this by being a part of it. He tells Zero that by trying to restore Soma and collecting the orbs, they were always destined to come here and face this. Oh no. The game warns us that it's going to be a while before he gets to save again. And we're told that we may want to make a separate save file. And I'm like, oh okay, I need to save anyways. And, but then, trying to proceed on with the text, I low-key frame perfect pressed yes and actually screamed out loud. Guess there's no going back now. Mason continues to berate the Sun King and all the damage he has done and is still doing thanks to Absolution. Mason tells us to give up on putting the world back together. While Zero believes that if they are capable of containing the power of Absolution, then they can use it for good, to restore Soma. Mason calls them a fool, which I partially agree with. This was the same problem with Bright when he thought he could use the power for good. In order to get us to understand, Mason chooses Brute Force. Throughout the fight, Mason tries to convince the group that there is no good in the power of Absolution. He doesn't want the world to be fragmented, but if using Absolution is the only way to bring it back, then maybe it's better off split. He's seen the destruction of Soma twice by now. He's been alive for over a century, and quite honestly, I think he knows what he's talking about. This fight takes many forms as Mason's mech transforms. The first form, he'll cycle through grabbing certain party members, stunning them. In the second phase, he'll use powerful star elemental magic. Which, you know, I guess I should drop the whole star elemental characters are a cool thing now. The final phase seems to be more of the same, but I did a ton of damage with Orb Blast, so it ended pretty fast. Even after the battle, Mason seems undefeated, trapping Zero's friends and throwing them down a pit. Zero, falling to their death, is given tips from their orb friend, successfully saving Zero's bacon. Regardless, it seems like our orb friend is also able to now talk to Zero outside of Zero losing consciousness. Exploring around, Zero finds more reports. The seventh one, now written by Mason, details Foss's passing. If I'm interpreting this correct, it seems that due to Foss denying Zeta the allowance of absolution, Zeta got their revenge and killed Foss for it. This caused Mason to put Zeta in confinement, only remembering Foss by calling him an idiot. Good looks, man. Which honestly, it's pretty sad that Foss's entire life got screwed over because he wanted to save his son, and was forced to spend the rest of his life doing work that I don't think he really wanted to do, with the threat of debt being used to coax him into compliance. I don't care if I may agree with Mason, he is an evil, evil person. He's no longer my man. Outside, security robots are everywhere, and using my nice stealth skills, we managed to pull through undetected. The 8th report states upon the creation of a spirit replica that can not only handle all of Absolution's power, but neutralize it and contain it forever. Omega. After reading these reports, we get these keycards, and they look just like the one that we picked up when someone slipped it under Zero's door back then. I wonder if this card will become important soon. The ninth report states that Mason needs to get Omega done soon before Zeta breaks free and causes ruin, bringing up how the true source of Absolution needs to be sealed. The next report is in what seems to be Mason's bedroom, including a picture of the Ice Princess from Soma Spirits, alongside a journal detailing what is likely when Mason first found the mask with his brother. I don't think he ever met his brother in Soma Spirits, I don't remember. 
But this picture of them together, I don't know, maybe it's the way it's laid out? But I feel like it's insinuating that this is Oakley. Hmm. We find more things around the room, such as a blueprint for the virtue, being built by Mason and Foss, to give the people of Soma a second chance should all things go wrong. And finally, the tenth report. This details the creation of Omega, being the perfect spirit replica. This replica can be the one to finally contain the power of absolution so it can never be used again, to bring absolution's power to zero. Zero is upset to learn of the purpose that they were made for, the purpose of what they have been trying to find this entire time, their entire life, was just to hold a world ending power of someone else's pain and misery. Zero takes their anger out on the orb in them for being in them, but I mean what do you want them to do Zero? They have no idea who they are or why they're there either. We find a sealed off door to the containment chamber, and while it initially seems we don't have the keycard to open it, Zero pulls out that one that we found on the Virtue, and it works. It's here we find where all the replicas were contained, except for Zeta I suppose. They kinda uncontained themselves, which means they are out there somewhere. But it's through here we find the orb that we came here for, but it's being contained. Alpha and Beta show up, explaining that they are only here due to Zeta, as it was Zeta that broke out and using the power of absolution caused the fragmentation of Soma, but also being unable to fully control it, the fragmentation of absolution itself, being fragmented into the orbs that we have been collecting, thusly the power to shape the world. Gamma shows up and explains that they were all brought back to help Zero see the power that they could safely wield, that they all suffered in order for Zero to succeed. The intention was for Zero to be infused with all four orbs of absolution, but we could also just take them and flee, prevent anyone from ever getting their hands on them again. Gamma brings up the spirit's potential purpose of helping others, with Zero wondering about that purpose. And just like the previous two times, the orb calls to Zero. It's time to make that decision once more, and to find out what's on Zero's horizon. Destiny. A spirit's purpose is to help people, in our intended way or not. Freedom. How I was created has no bearing on how I choose to help others. I won't lie, I thought about this one for a bit, but I chose what my heart told me. Everyone talks about a spirit's purpose, but what about Zero's purpose? Something about being created with your life already set before you by someone else? Nah, I can't sit with that. If your entire life is just decisions made by someone else, is that even really your life? Your choices? Zero may be a spirit, but before that, they're themselves. Freedom baby. All the way. Zero collects the orb, wondering what they should do with this fragment of absolution. But it seems like somebody else answers that question for Zero. We can finally restore Soma. So then Guidance walks in, congratulating Zero, saying that we can finally put this mission to the rest. And I'm just like, oh crap, we're all gonna die. Because Guidance is actually Zeta, the spirit that escaped and destroyed Soma to begin with. Zeta states that Absolution has the power to shape the world as you please. Zero learns that when Absolution was lost 20 years ago, it was because Zero himself took it from Zeta. Zeta tries to convince Zero to give him absolution so he can create a world where spirits can be free, to create a world where they rule. Zero is unsure about this as the other spirits tell Zero not to be convinced before getting knocked out. Lewin and Rekka show up too only for all three to get clapped by Zeta, who takes their pieces of absolution showing that he has the final orb, putting them back together to create our familiar masked friend once more. Zeta calls upon the power and absolution is in full agreement to give it to him. Zero stands against them, to which Zeta uses the power to turn Zero into a violent killing machine. However, unable to control the power, they are called by the orb in them, and as chapter 3 ends, we wake up in Zero's dream world. It's falling apart, Zero and the orb run off, and with the object on the horizon finally apparent, they jump in. We end up somewhere that kind of reminds me of the end of Soma Spirits, with the Sun King's mask and statues everywhere. Seeing it seems to finally jog our orb friend's memory, 
as he turns into his true self. It's bright, baby. God, I was tired of calling him Orb. Time's getting pretty short, though, considering the world is probably about to get destroyed, so we need to get out of this dream world and awaken together. Bright joins the party, and yeah, he's pretty awesome. And not even because he has star skills, because we're done with that garbage. He's just cool. Even though he's kind of the reason the world got screwed over. Twice. Does this mean he's like over 100 years old? Definitely explains the old man jokes he was hitting us with at the beginning. It seems like our escape is going to be through this massive door, but first we need to find a way to open it. I love that Sergeant M can put eyes on any object and I can automatically call it good character design. Despite being a soda machine, they don't actually sell soda. Which you know what? Good for you. Because just because you were born a soda machine- Yeah Spacey, this character has like three lines of dialogue, can we get on with it? The enemies around here all are the shadow spawn of Absolution, which makes sense considering Zero is currently fighting them off. Which I guess means the reason shadow spawn were appearing on the ship was because of Zeta, as he did have a piece of Absolution, and much like Gamma, could control them as he pleases, which is probably why they disappear often when he shows up, or he fights them to look good. Knowing what we know now, there's probably some dark intention to him making these attacks Zero at points. Back to Bright. He's got some powerful skills, and even a counter, and I know what you're thinking. A counter? Oh, Spacey's gonna hate this. But no, believe it or not, I enjoy counter characters in some situations. Bright's counter taunts as well, so enemies target him. But also, we're only working with two party members here, so it's already a 50-50. Also, I like how it only counters physical attacks. It lets me study enemies throughout the dungeon to know their attacks, and having that knowledge on which enemies primarily use physical attacks actually changes how I interact with the same enemies throughout the dungeon. Going through the dungeon, we learn the rest of the story on what happened that day. After being notified of the siege, Bright and his friends run back to the castle. Along the way, they find a river that they need to pass over, and instead of Bright using his powers, the team does things the old-fashioned way as a team, tying the rope bridge. At the castle, we find it getting destroyed by the spirits of the sister and the brother, which are both convincing different sides of the Sun King's world to fight against each other. The group rushes off to stop this, and back in the dream world, that big door opens up as well. Well, kinda. More like it turns into a gate pack and heat. The Ragnarok gate. It's made up of different parts. The assault modules will blast you while the guard modules will buff and heal everyone else, and the gate itself can drain and attack everyone. You could target the guard module specifically if you want, but both Zero and Bright have attacks that hit everyone, and Zero should be really strong by now if you give them all the drinks. Which, by now you probably should have used the drinks at some point. Pulse, as per usual, destroys this fight, and if for some reason you don't have Pulse equipped, well buddy, stop being a hipster and join the meta, okay? I'm getting real tired of you. What do you run? Rocket Blast? Get out of here! After their defeat, the gate opens, which brings us to what is actually one of the final screens of Soma Spirits, where you meet the Sun King. I looked this up just to make sure. But here we find out the rest of the story. The three in the castle continue fighting as Absolution makes the note that with its power, Bright can destroy anything, which actually gives him an idea. At the top of the castle, we see a familiar area, but also the two orbs, wishing to take the power of Absolution. The three friends team up together, prepared to fight against the two, even pulling out their weapons. Wait a second. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> we battle against the two, which is more of a cutscene fight, but look, Rosen is using fire magic and Silvio has gale magic. Sadly, the three get beaten. But taking what Absolution said earlier, Bright destroys it, but not with its own power, causing it to be fragmented into four familiar orbs. However, even with that, the two orbs still want to scrap. Rosen and Silvio sacrifice themselves so Bright can get away, and Bright, using the last of his power of Absolution, gives Rosen and Silvio the promise to be reborn, and to save Soma. Bright dons the fake mask and decides to fight the two orbs, aka, Form and Dissonance in a battle that is so fierce that the world of Soma was split, which made it so neither form nor dissonance could fully rule it. Years later, the two heroes of Soma Spirit show up, heart and soul, the reincarnations of Rosen and Silvio brought by Bright. And even though they didn't recognize him, they still work together to defeat form and dissonance. But Absolution was still out there, because Bright wasn't strong enough to fully destroy the mask. Bright blames himself, but Zero says his friends wouldn't have been there to save the world if it wasn't for the fact that they always believed in him. I mean, Zero wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for Bright's actions. But with that in mind, why is Bright here? Well, we learned that too. 
Cutting to the final boss of Soma Spirits, Bright gets separated from heart and soul and uses the rest of his power to help his friends escape, and due to this, he becomes Orb and drifts through space. We then see when Zeta broke out of the laboratory, claiming absolution with the plan of destroying the world and creating a new one, where spirits aren't just vessels. The threat to the laboratory causes Zero to be broken out too, where Bright, having no idea who he is anymore, just decides to enter them. This causes Yuri to have so much power that they turn gold and flies up to Zeta and starts slapping him up, stopping him from fully destroying Soma, only leaving it fragmented. This is the light that Lumen saw that day, it was actually caused by Zero stopping Zeta. Which I guess caused his absolution to get split into four again, with Zeta claiming his peace. He finds a knocked out Zero and takes them too. He jacks the Virtue with the Epsilon replicas and a few people from Soma and he takes off with the plan of getting Absolution once more. Zero had forgotten all about this and wonders if they really stopped Absolution or if it was just Bright that stopped them, in which case they still don't know who they are. Bright helps convince them that they've always been themselves and this is where Zero realizes that they never really needed a purpose. They thought they needed one because Guidance was trying to lead them to find Absolution, making up lies about how all spirits need a purpose and are named after that purpose. Zero, now determined to stop Guidance, and Bright, facing his responsibility to fix his mistakes, came up with the confidence to beat up Zeta and slap Absolution too. Back at the laboratory with no time seemingly passed at all from Zero being in their dream world, which is pretty realistic when you consider that a dream time to real time comparison. Zero rejects Absolution and uses Dare and Bright's own powers, becoming gold once more. They fight back and heal up everyone. I love this line by Absolution here, realizing that Bright is still here. Everyone lines up against Zeta, who uses the power of Absolution to try to destroy this factory and everyone in it, further continuing his plan of creating a world where nobody has to be used by anyone else and everyone can be free by killing everyone, but making a new world on top of it? Well, the factory is going to hell, so let's get out of here. Alpha, Beta, and Gamma try to sacrifice themselves, but Zero's not about that and convinces them to tag along when they can. We team up and fight several Dark Matter along the way. The group makes it out and find an escape pod, but we're still under attack. That is until Professor M shows up once more and chooses to stay behind so everyone else can escape. He puts his faith in us that when the time comes, we will destroy Absolution for good and save Soma. Everyone gets on except Rekka, who has one final talk with Mason, referencing Elder Oakley, where he does actually seem to confirm that Oakley is his brother, which I somehow missed until watching it now. But regardless, the group flies off, leaving Mason behind, sacrificing himself for good. And, you know, I think Mason was a pretty horrible person. He hurt a lot of people and overall just seemed like a jerk. But I think his heart was in the right place. I can understand where he's coming from, seeing the world getting destroyed twice and the things that happened to him. I think he's a victim in his own way, seeing how nice he used to be. And I guess if Zero does end up saving Soma and destroying Absolution, then yeah, Mason did it. He saved the world. Maybe in some ways he was the only one that really could have done it, just in his own sick way. I don't know, I feel like there could have been another way. If anything, maybe he could have been a nicer person to Foss in the spirit replicas he made. But with that, chapter 4 is over. Back on the ship, Zero talks to Bright about the pressure of having to save the world, but Bright reminds him that they aren't alone. So we go to check on everyone else, hearing everyone's opinions on how some of them are replicas, how the captain betrayed all of them for 20 years of their lives. Alpha, Beta, and Gamma are of course here too. The Epsilon models don't seem to entirely have a problem with hearing about how they are replicas as most of them already understand themselves enough that it ultimately means nothing. But still, everyone's pretty bummed out about the betrayal from Guidance. You can even read the book of lies about spirits having purposes in the library, where Zero even comments on it. Talking to Rekka and Lumen separately, they think about the choices they made with their orbs and ultimately the future they want to live. Rekka and a couple others suggest that Zero take over as the new captain, with Zero still unsure of this considering how low the morale of everyone is. Back at the Garden Dome, the three friends, I mean, the four friends, reflect on everything that has happened so far, unsure of where Zeta and Absolution are but are still determined to take them down as a team when the time comes, and that time happens to be pretty soon. Just like when the gang saw their first piece of Soma on this journey, they look out the window to see a large castle with the face of Absolution on it. 
and they've determined to win this fight here and now, beginning the last chapter. Um, you know, be before we uh, continue, I would like to introduce everyone to my Torch 60 OC. I, I, I know, I know, I'm a, I'm a little nervous, so I, I don't really know how to describe them with words, so I'm just gonna... This is Borny, you know, like corn and bread, but I had to... But I added a Y on it because I was feeling a little spicy that day, you know? Borny. You may be wondering, because they're cornbread, if you can eat them and... No. What's wrong with you? That'd be really mean. Zero gathers everyone on the bridge. Most are afraid of the giant castle that likely will kill them all. Zero, reflecting on the choice that they made in the factory, gives an inspirational speech to everyone. And I have to say, I love how far Zero has come since the beginning of this adventure. You can really feel like they're a different person by this point. Even earlier throughout the factory, they always had that look of determination and finding out the truth, and they never stepped down. Where I felt like when we first got to know them, they were just a scared person who felt like a screw up, too afraid to fight for themselves and hopeless on themselves and everyone else's future. But here they are, as the new leader, the true leader, standing up for all of their friends. It's time for the end game, with Drip telling us, I mean, the Cool Jacket Spirit telling us to talk to them when we're ready to go. Through talking to the characters and reflecting on our decisions, we actually got some new skills that may even change depending on what orbs you chose. Not entirely sure, but Lumen got Triage, which is basically a super heal, but I also basically never used it. Rekka got Encourage, which is probably one of the best abilities in the game, with Rekka giving an ally a massive attack boost for their next attack, with her losing a turn afterwards because of it, it can just lead to some bonko damage. Zero gets Reverb, which is basically Poison Stall Deluxe Ultra Turbo with or without the Mayo at 3am, no safe word, unexpected ending, plus Alpha, and I'm not gonna say any more than that. But just like in the crappy music I make, I sure as hell spammed the reverb. One final thing I want to talk about however, is the crew themselves. There is a ton of dialogue for them after nearly every event in this game. And special mention to the green cooking spirit, where over the course of the game you can see them become a cook that everyone loves, which really hammers down the point of being yourself and finding the things you enjoy and want to do in life, rather than the fate you were destined to go through. I guess I wish more of the spirits grew like that over the journey, because the cook is a bit of a standout character for me amongst the other ship members. Okay, I think it's time to head- OH MY GOD! I think I'll place you down here, looking beautiful as always, buddy. Okay, let's go beat up Absolution and Zeta real quick. The Corrupted Citadel. I will have to say, the intense mood feels a little subverted when the first enemy I run into is the toaster targeter. I mean, look at how cute they are. They do be blasting though. Hey, whoa, what the hell? An instant kill attack? You're messed up, homie. Luckily, I can do the same thing back. This is the only time I use this sigil. I also love the battle theme here. The gimmick for the most part on the lower floors is teleport doors, which I happen to get pretty lucky on. Maybe playing those Yume Nikki fan games really gave me some sacred intuition. Later on has more puzzles, key collecting, and... Well... It was by this point of the game, I reflected on all the dungeons thus far, and I realized something. Something fascinating about the creator of this game. He sure likes to put bounce pads everywhere. I feel like the conveyance of climbing the tower is handled pretty well, with the appearance of it changing as you rise up the floors. I really like the blue when you're nearing the top, it's actually very pretty. This is the final dungeon, so it's time to get our ultimate equipment, which is obtained by fighting souped up versions of previous bosses. It's fun to refight bosses when your team is leveled up and gain new skills, and you can drop new strategies on them. Like look how much damage I did here to the Grand Granite. Wowie! It's upon their defeat that you get to choose what form of equipment you want. Like, if you want the best book or the best scalpel for Lumen, or the best sword or best hammer for Rekka. In the posable Nova Ring? That's cute. Only true fans know. Yeah, I'm gatekeeping. Though for some reason, maybe I missed it, but Zero doesn't get a weapon. 
I mean, I thought I did all the refights, but I just never found a weapon. I don't know, F0, I guess. Oh no, I didn't I didn't mean the game. I mean F0, like zero got screwed. You know, I was lying in bed thinking about the script because that's what I do when I can't sleep and my mind is obsessed with something, and I unintentionally thought of that F0 joke, and I thought it was really funny. Wait, hold up. Get a load of this one, Uzi Lord. Can you believe that? You're not running, buddy. Face justice, scum. No, no, please. Why? Regardless, with the best equipment we can get, I think it's time we finish this. We climb up the stairs to reach the top of the tower. Guidance standing there. The group tries to convince Guidance to stop this one last time, but Guidance turns and says this is something he has to do. Just like Zero, he wondered what was on his horizon, and for him, this is it. Even back then, thinking about the day he would have to come out about his betrayal, this was his own determination and passion, and even when the idea of Soma being put together finally came, at this point 20 years has passed, and at that point he might as well go for his plan. He asks the opposite, for Zero to believe in him, his dream, his goal, and I kind of feel bad for him. But all he sounds like doing is running away from the past. Which although is my preferred style, I still agree with Zero that ultimately erasing what happened to the spirits will never teach us to learn and face the reality of the mistakes of it. For as similar as the two are, their desires are opposites. Zero doesn't want the people of Soma to die. And so, we battle. I know I was gonna meme with how every song is the best song in this game, but I'm not kidding. This is my favorite song in the game. It's so good. And it really gives a sense of importance to Guidance, almost a heroic sound to him, because even though he screwed us for 20 years, he was also waiting 20 years to do this. It gives that kind of impact that you're imposing on someone else's dream. It's such a great thematic fight too. Zero is basically made to stop Guidance, and all these years later, they're here to do it again, but this time for their own reason, their own beliefs are guiding them. Not why they were created, but who they are. Meanwhile, Guidance was just another inferior replica to be thrown away forever in favor of the improved Zero, but with Absolution, he can be on par with Zero. He can prove his entire existence isn't just so Zero can exist, that he isn't just an inferior version. I know this is probably a very weird take considering this guy wants to go turbo genocide in an arguably pretty racist way, but I do think Guidance is one of my favorite Torch 60 characters. Tough fight too, he does a ton of damage with his attacks, I basically had to heal every turn. But with the right setup, I managed to get a lot of damage done, and we take him out. Absolution deems Guidance unworthy and instead goes for Zero. It tries to convince Zero to use it, the same way it did all those years ago to Bright. Even Guidance tells Zero not to listen to Absolution, who kinda ends up killing him. Absolution goes on ahead, challenging us to one last fight. We talk to the dying Guidance, who regrets his actions leading to this point, saying he just wanted to be a hero. He realizes that Absolution is truly a wicked, evil power. He tells us that we could still use it to bring Soma back, to finally restore it, or we could choose to destroy it for good, at the cost of Soma never being fixed, and us likely living the rest of our lives on the ship, with nowhere to call home. Guidance believes in the end, the team will make the right choice before passing away. And honestly, I can't hate Guidance. Maybe he wanted to kill everyone, but I think his heart was in the right place. He just wanted to create a place where he and his spirit friends could be happy, but in the end everyone turned against him, even being defeated by the same person he wanted to help. And don't get me wrong, I couldn't ever agree with what he was trying to do, but I can respect it. And the way he emotionally manipulated people like Zero is pretty terrible. He screwed a lot of people, but unlike Mason, I feel like he still cared. But with Guidance out of the way, we have our final obstacle remaining, Absolution. And you know what, you didn't have to kill Guidance, so I'm here for your head too. We walk forward, looking down a monstrous pit as Absolution once more tries to convince us to use its power. But we aren't falling for that garbage, it's go time. This fight can be hard, especially if you get unlucky and get one shot critted on the character that's currently hosting the aura, nice. Defense is going to be your best offense here, so get Lumen's regen aura and chip away how you can. Dazzle can earn you some extra turns if Absolution misses its attacks. 
and keep that poison and pulse DOTs up at a constant. When you do enough damage, Absolution unleashes a powerful attack on the entire party. Everyone is heavily injured and it seems like this is the end. The group thinks of everything they've been through and all the sacrifices they've made, and Bright, using the last of his power, once again helps his friends, turning Zero golden and fully healing the party. Hell yeah. This leads to the final phase of the fight. This one's oppressive. It was often I had everyone in support just to try and handle all the debuffs and damage being dealt. Get your damage over time skills out because they're going to be a lifesaver. Throughout the fight, the other party members recall their choices and become golden as well, dealing a powerful attack to Absolution. Because I guess you can never truly have singularity, as long as there are people still out there with a the free will to think and do for themselves. As long as you don't get greedy, you should be fine for this fight. It's a grueling battle, but in the end, everyone comes together and unleashes their light on Absolution as it desperately tries to convince us to stop. And with that, it's finally defeated. It's over. With Bright's power fading, so is he. The two trios of friends look at each other, similar yet so different. With Zero at one point even falling down the same path as Bright, but that's why we have the past, to help guide our future. Bright says a tearful goodbye, thanking his new friends as he leaves with his old ones, reminding us one final time not to make the same mistake he did. The Orbs of Absolution appears before us one last time. Zero, understanding what Bright meant, isn't going to make this decision themselves, but rather with their friends, as a team, and they're going to take responsibility together. This leads us to the game's final choice, which will ultimately determine our ending. Restore Soma, or destroy Absolution. They each have their own pros and cons. If we restore Soma, the world can finally go back to normal. We can rebuild. This was our mission all along, wasn't it? But we'd be using Absolution. It would still be there, and one day it could be used for evil again. Or we could destroy Absolution for good. We could ensure it could never cause the destruction of Soma again. But at the same time, Soma will still be destroyed. Our group may spend the rest of their lives looking for a home. I actually made the choice rather fast. When Bright said, don't make the same mistake I did, I assumed he meant using Absolution to begin with. It needs to be destroyed. So many people had to die and suffer because of Absolution, and to let those sacrifices be in vain? I couldn't. Not when those same people gave up their lives in order for us to see this through. There is nothing good that can ever come from Absolution. The group destroys Absolution for good, and once again continues their voyage, ultimately sacrificing their wishes in order to ensure a safer future for Soma. The three go over the choices they made to shape the world, which in the end served more to how they shaped themselves. Rekka realizes that being rooted in one place all her life is actually pretty boring, and it's not like she can do that anyways because we chose not to restore Soma. So she's going to do her best to bring the best out of everyone. Lumen is glad with his choice to stay a doctor and help everyone on the ship. This is what he wanted. This is what makes him happy. Staying true to himself. Well put, Lumen. Zero thinks about how Guidance wanted to create a world just for spirits. But Zero instead strives to create a world for everyone, regardless of who or what they are. And Zero isn't doing this because they're a spirit and spirits are supposed to help people. They're doing this because they believe that everyone should always help each other, wanting not just to look on their horizon, but everybody's. They understand the decision they made, and vow to keep searching for their home, even if they may never find it. I feel fucking terrible. Feel good? I feel like I want to cry. Average session? About half an hour? Oh snap! On the real though, I do feel terrible. I felt awful when I finished this game. I gave these characters a terrible ending. I forced them to be trapped on the same ship that they spent their lives trying to get off of. And that kind of sucks. But I like to think that the home that they've been searching for is not an actual place rather than the people they're with. And as long as everyone here is together, then they can call this place home. While you may think we'll find the other pieces of Soma easily, we only found the ones in this game due to Bright, and he's gone, so without Bright we're still on a 20 year streak of nothing. You might be thinking then, Spacey, why don't you look at the other ending, the other choices? I'll be honest, I don't want to. 
I have no interest in seeing the other choices made. It's not that I don't care, it's because I care too much. I don't think I could ever play this game making different decisions. To choose destiny over freedom, to choose to rebuild Soma instead of destroying Absolution. I just couldn't. And that's because that's what I think this game is about. Freedom. The ability and desire to stray from what's expected from you. Stray from a life chosen by someone else. We aren't destined to be anything but ourselves. And if you can't love yourself to do what you want, how are you going to care about others? I think that's seen all throughout the game. Freedom, the cost of responsibility, the people that get hurt from it. Absolution is a power that thrives for singularity. A power that influences minds with freedom, but ultimately just to serve its goal laid out for you. I see it as a game about going against the past. The people that expect you to be and grow a certain way, and being brave enough to turn your back and potentially hurt others you chose to leave behind. To remember the importance of the people that can stick and care for what you are and what you want to do, and to care for them back. Because maybe the Union and Soma Union isn't about uniting the world of Soma, but the uniting of friends coming together to understand themselves and each other, ultimately making the choice together on how they want to help the world. And maybe this is just a reflection of my own personal life, and that's why I may potentially and biasly see this name over others. But if there's one thing I do believe, it's the self. While the world we live in seems to believe that self-love is something to be denoted and have a negative stigma placed upon it, being known as selfish, I think you can only help others when you can help yourself. I don't know, I could be completely incorrect at the intended theme of this game, but this is just my interpretation. And it's not like freedom is always good either, because there's still the responsibilities of your actions. The people that do get hurt, that you can choose to face, or to run from forever. And while I feel terrible for what I did, I can't help but to say the same words I was saying to myself as I watched the credits go by. I made the right choice. Hey, there's some cool post-game stuff. Let's talk about it. It's going to be fun. So after clearing the game, we're taken back to just before the final boss. But two portals open up on the Virtue, apparently leading to new, challenging foes. One is in the item shop, and the other is in the toy shop, of course, being the Cooler Crusader. I decided to leave the Cooler Crusader for last, mostly because I was curious with what this one in the shop is. Wait a second, it's under a picture of a sun. Hmm, let's see what this is about. Whoa, mushroom! Should this place feel familiar? I feel like I've been here before. Is this what I think it is? It's almost sundown? Alright, come out you guys. Aw oh, snap, it really is them. Nova, Klieg, Floros, Zero! It's the Sundown Squad, man! Yay! Woo! They appeared in another Torch 60 game, Crescent Prism. And of course, as per usual, their mission is to make it so the sun never sets, so nobody will ever have to sleep. Love it. They say they're heading off to take over a place ruled by someone known as the Sun King, only for us to inform them that they're a little over a hundred years late. Nova doesn't believe us though, so if a fight is what he wants, then let's battle. Aw oh man, it's even the Crescent Prism battle theme. It even uses the moon system mechanic from Crescent Prism. I believe this is how the fight went down in Crescent Prism, where one of the three will become invincible depending on the phase of the moon. That was one of the cool things about Crescent Prism. It had a battle system that depending on the moon phase could affect both the actions of the player and their opponent. At least I think so. I'd go back to check but for some reason I saved like a billion times during the Sundown Squad chapter. But there, yeah, your moon phase affects what skills you can use. I guess it'd kind of be like if somehow this game managed to have support and power rolls for both the player and the enemies, however the hell that would work. At least in terms of a universal battle mechanic that applies to all actors. Sorry, if you can't tell, I secretly think Crescent Prism is really cool. One of them is invincible during a moon phase, and the moon phase shifts every three turns. There is a new moon phase where all of them are vulnerable, but despite this, I think that your best strategy is to pick whoever you think is the most threatening and target them. Because this fight gets a lot easier after defeating one of them. You can still go for Poison Pulse Reverb tactics, but it won't be as effective as whoever is invincible for that moon shift won't be affected by it, and those who are poisoned will cleanse themselves upon becoming invulnerable. And I guess in the end, you can really make single target attacks powerful in this game. The group is in shock at their defeat, and Nova is so upset that he jumps on his vent account and starts going to town. 
Do you have any idea what we went through to come up with this ingenuity? No, not really. How did you guys even know there was a Sun King out there? Do you have any idea how hard it is to keep the sun from setting? No, not really. How do you guys even do that? Didn't you have to like steal a staff or something? The rant goes on for so long that by the time he finishes, the sun is already gone. Realizing defeat, Nova gives us an item to remember him by. That he sure as sugar doesn't need. The summoner rod. Which I think was the rod they stole during Crescent Prism? Isn't it kind of amazing how damaged my memory is? They screw off and so do we. Hey, should I give this back to Lunita? And eh, whatever. That was cool. But you know what time it is. It's time to check on the Cooler Crusader. Going through the portal, we arrive assumedly somewhere on Soma, the Crusader Studios. There's a group outside and apparently the Crusader himself is coming to see everyone. Sadly, instead we just get some guy dressed up as the Cooler Crusader. Rekka isn't having any of this though and stands up and gives a passionate speech. And you know what? I'm right there with you Rekka. We want the real Cooler Crusader. Zero suggests just coming back another day, but Rekka says that there are people that have waited their whole lives for this moment, and you know what? She's right. I've waited my whole life for this, I'm not folding now. Rekka takes charge in order to find the Crusader himself. Zero and Lumen give chase as Rekka slaps up the security, with us arriving at the big man's office. We meet the Crusader, who doesn't quite seem to have the same energy he used to have. After being a hero for over a hundred years, he's grown bored of it. He's grown so famous that he doesn't need to be a hero anymore. If anything, he questions how he can be a hero to anyone in particular when there are so many people that see him as an icon. Rekka, however, believes that he can still be a hero in his own way and wants to prove him wrong. So a battle it is. 1. I like the fit. 2. The music. This is actually one of my other favorite songs in this game. It also boosts the Cooley Crusader for me, like god this dude is so cool. He doesn't even try at first during the fight, striking us with attacks that are extremely weak, seemingly having no interest in the fight at all. This is until Rekka tells him that even though he can't see the lives of everyone that are his fans, he is still influencing people to become heroes themselves. Defining their lives thanks to the heroics of the Cooler Crusader, which probably isn't healthy, but in response, the Cooler Crusader realizes, Rekka's right. She's really right. Really, really right. Even if his fire has burned out, others will carry the torch and spirit. He finds his passion once more thanks to believing in others. And you know what time it is, baby. He transforms into a new, never before seen form, Crusader Mark III. And now the real fight begins. And yeah, this is probably the hardest fight in the game. If you're on hard mode and your party's health isn't nearly always full, I don't know what to tell you because these attacks can take nearly full HP. Buying and equipping some ice resistant rings beforehand or using Zero's elemental resist aura can really help out though. Big brain plays I sure as hell didn't do. He's weak to fire so you can ideally try to deal fire damage however you know how. But by this point, in a lot of the end game, I was running time fracture zero, spending 10 SP so I could go twice in one turn. Mix this with max amp on their magic alongside a Rekka and Courage and I could do a lot of damage at once. I haven't felt this alive in years. I have faced many villains in my time, but now I am facing the greatest villain of them all. Discontent. The song here rocks too by the way. You know, you could probably cheese this fight if you just sit with your aura and camp out the first phase for like an hour, constantly healing the aura wielder's MP. And by the time the second phase comes around, ideally one shot the Crusader with Aura Blast. With the power of Zero's own brokenness, we pull through. Like look, 1700 in one attack, 3000 total damage in one turn, wow. It's a long fight, honestly got knocked out more here than all previous fights combined. But we defeat the Crusader. He thanks Rekka for helping to inspire him to be a hero once more, inviting us all to be the kind of heroes the world needs. Now pumped up, he gives us a poster to remember him by before going to inspire the next generation of heroes. And you know what? Let me hang up that poster. I may have started Torch 60 games thinking the Cooler Crusader was some annoying loser, but now? Listen, me and the Cooler right here, we go way back. So if you think you can get away with hating on him, you're gonna have to get through me. 
because I am a fan of the man. Give me all the merch. Cooler Crusader posters, action figures, plushies, a Cooler Crusader fridge. Can you imagine that? It'd be basically a life-size version of the guy. And just think of all the cool things you could do with him. You could give him a half five. You could give him a hug. Truly limitless possibilities in the functionality. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like the future of appliances to me. Anyways, after that, we leave back to the ship. And, well, I suppose that's everything to do. So, I guess I can give my overall thoughts now. Soma Union is amazing. It's everything I expected and wanted from a Torch 60 game, but also a lot more. Somehow with every game Torch 60 makes, they get better and better, which is saying something because Soma Spirits is a bit of a special game in my heart. Pun intended. But yeah, Soma Union is it. I loved the gameplay, with its unique and fun mechanics that never made fights boring. I loved its story, re-exploring a broken world and the themes I found from it. I loved the characters and the crew that changed with the story. I don't mean to roast Yusha or anything, but I think Sergeant M has gotten a lot better with stories and his characters as his games went on. I guess if anything, I wish there was even more. More with characters like Alpha, Beta, and Gamma, because I thought those characters were pretty sweet. All I'm saying is 90 years down the line, if Union follows the same format as the other Torch 60 games and we get Soma Union reunited or something, a playable Alpha, Beta, and Gamma would be pretty dope. Can I just say that? Can I just say that? Let me just say that. I mean, I don't really know what they would do. They're just, they're just chilling on the sh ship. They're just sitting there, but still, I just like these three, okay? And I guess I also wish there was more to the world. As much as I think Soma Union is the best Torch 60 game, I still think about the world of other games, Soma Spirits in particular. I felt like, when looking back on Soma Spirits, that world had so much mystique to it. Something about some of the areas really stood out more to me. Maybe it's because it was my first Torch 60 game, but I just feel like there was some magic to the parts of the world that I just didn't feel with Union. And I know what you're thinking. Spacey? That's probably the dumbest thing I've ever heard in a review. And well, one, watch some IGN reviews and come back to me. Two. You're right, but it's just weird when you consider that Soma Union takes place on the same world as Soma Spirits. I guess what I feel is that while I was exploring other worlds with the other Torch 60 games, with Soma Union, I really felt like I was just exploring dungeons. Like I wasn't discovering new pieces of Soma to explore, I was just discovering the next dungeon. Which is weird, right? Because that's what Soma Spirits was, but I don't know, I felt like I barely understood the world I was trying to save in Union. Well, there were some instances of areas where I did get that same vibe as with Spirit, such as the snowy forest section leading into the laboratory. Both the song and the area gave such a mysterious but adventurous vibe I really enjoyed. Perhaps it was just because the snowy area was an outside area? Maybe I just wish I got to explore Soma more rather than the interiors of the man-made structures of it. Which is a very head-tilting thing to say, and not as much as a complaint rather than a thought that I had that I thought was rather interesting enough to share. I mean, this game is already a lot. Like, it took me 15 hours to beat. And it was 15 hours that never involved backtracking to previous areas of the like. It was new area after new area. Unless if I accidentally backtracked because I'm dummy. So, I don't intend to mean that this game needs more. I'm just saying I love this game and this world so much that any extra thing I can get about it, I'll love. But I suppose in the end though, Soma Union shouldn't be trying to follow in the footsteps of Soma Spirits, but instead, be its own thing. Eh? Eh? Get it? You know, freedom. Yeah. One other cool thing about the story is how it sort of calls back to Soma Spirits in a way, unintentional or not. Like, think about it. With Area 1 being a grassy forest place, involving the decision of an acorn on whether or not they want to grow up to be a tree rooted in the ground. Area 2 being a traditionally fun commercial area with a mascot character being overworked and hating their job, but knowing they have to work to keep the place alive. Area 3 being a snowy area where you meet a guy named Mason. Okay, th that last one was a bit of a stretch, but still, Area 3 has a lot of Snowman Spirits callbacks anyways. And of course, being betrayed by the person in between areas that would help guide your team on what they should do next and where to go. I don't know if this is intentional, but I think it's pretty neat. I love 
Soma Union. I mean, just look at the length of this video. I had stuff to say about this game. But I guess there's more things I want to talk about. So, if it isn't obvious with how I've been describing them, Zero uses they them pronouns, and everyone respects that, even villains and people that barely know them. And in a world of talking carrots and magical spirits, that might be the most unrealistic thing. I guess a part of me feels like this isn't really worth talking about in a way, because Zero being non-binary doesn't define them, and to bring attention to it and make it some big important thing is sort of disrespectful. Like, it's about as relevant to the plot as Lumen being he him and Rekka being she her. But on the other hand, it just makes me happy. And being able to play as a non-binary character is the coolest god dang thing in this world to me, baby. But I am glad it wasn't a huge part of their character, by the way. I like that it's just normal in this world for people to be like that. Hell yeah, Zero. So, now with Soma Spirits and Soma Union, you may be wondering, when's the next Soma game? And that's honestly probably not going to happen, especially considering the openness of the ending of Union, but I suppose, what? For real? A new Soma game just released? Are you serious? Hey, we gotta check this out. Wow, Soma Union just dropped. Sergeant M is fast. Not only that, but from what I heard, Sergeant M has been experimenting with RPG maker MZ. I've never played a game made in that engine before. And you know what? Leave it up to Sergeant M to show me what this system is capable of. Let's see what this new Soma game is about. Uh... Needless to say, am I gonna need to make another 2 hour plus analysis video? Soma Onion was released in 2021, and you play the role of the Soma Onion, who's going out to get some garlic to help them make garlic soup. As you may have noticed with me pressing the down arrow key at the title screen and shifting the game upwards, this game is actually played in browser. Which I don't know, I feel like there's always something a bit more personal when you download a game and put it on your computer. Regardless, checking out the presentation, you may have noticed this game looks nothing like the previous Soma games. I suppose Sergeant M just wanted to play around with a new art style for his next big release, which I can respect. But I do miss the previous art style that in some ways kind of defined these games. The same for the music. This is pretty different from Agent 8's normal music. Maybe he's just playing it by ear this time, or just wanted to try something new. But something about the Overworld Area song makes me feel like I'm playing Mario Golf Toadstool Tour. Anyways, gameplay wise, Soma Onion is very daring. Always thought that after Soma Spirits being a two person party game, Sergeant M could somehow make a one person party game work, and that's what he went for with this game. You have 6 minutes to explore the world of Soma, getting as much garlic as you can before time runs out, and the soup burns. Equipment slot wise, there are 5 different equipment slots, but only 2 of them are used. So essentially, there's only 2 equipment slots, but still somehow manages to be better than Amori. In a surprise twist, encounters are all on screen, and typically forced that they don't move, making it the second Soma game to have on-screen encounters. Soma Onion themselves has 3 different skills, one to cure status effects, one to heal themselves, and a strong attack. I was surprised to see the SP system from previous games not returning. Instead, we got TP, and I know what you're thinking. Spacey, I don't need any toilet paper. And no dummy, not that kind of TP. I'm talking about... Actually, I'll be honest, I don't know what TP stands for. Uh, how about turmeric points? For the unaware, turmeric points is basically like meter in a fighting game. It raises from doing a multitude of actions, such as dealing and being dealt damage, and it can be spent on skills. In this case, the strong attack. It takes Onion two normal attacks to take out most enemies, but the strong attack can take them out in one turn. Starting TP is a little luck based too, and I don't mean based on your luck stat, which actually is in this game. Sometimes you just have more TP at battle start, sometimes even high enough that you can start an encounter out with strong attack. The game also doesn't have any consumable items, which makes sense. How is Onion going to carry around all this delicious garlic if their inventory is being wasted on pointless things such as healing potions? The only way you can restore your HP and MP outside of Onion's cure spell is by sleeping in their house, but this is actually a f***ing lie because it only restores their MP and definitely badoozied me when I got into a fight after taking a quickie snooze. I saw I had full MP, but my HP was rather hungry. Oops. Youch. Garlic can be found everywhere, from barrels to pots to chests, and it's a very open world game. You really get to choose where you want to go and it encourages exploration, because the whole game is about it. 
collect as much garlic as you can, and depending on how well you do, you get a different ending. Which makes sense. Soma games have always had different endings depending on your actions, and this game is no different. Overall, I'd say that Soma Onion is a brave yet fresh take at the Soma series, and while some may call it an outlier amongst the other games, I see it as an important stepping stone for the future of the series. Okay, let's stop playing around. Sergeant M just wanted to screw around in RPG Maker MZ for a bit. All the graphics are just default RPG Maker graphics besides the title screen and the character sprite. Which, while you may think that walking around as an onion is pretty strange, I could only think to myself how the walk cycle manages to be more expressive and bouncy than anything I've ever done. This goes for the music as well, I'm pretty sure this is all just default stuff, this isn't some secret Agent Ape soundtrack or anything. But despite that, I still kind of find it oddly fun to play through for just a bit. I mean, everything here works, and the extremely simple combat system works for basically a 6 minute game. I think the saddest thought I had while playing it was, so, an RPG where you go around and collect things under a time limit. This reminds me of Recovery. I'm sorry, Recovery. <laughs> so let's talk about the endings of Soma Onion. As always, here's a spoiler warning. I know, I know, you're skipping a large chunk of the video here, but I have a lot to say about the endings. At first I got the silver ending, because I accidentally forgot to check an entire area, so I had to play the entire game again, but I did it because I wanted this onion to be happy. And this time, I got the best ending, I even somehow got more garlic than... wait, that doesn't make sense. But regardless, the onion has mastered the art of onion soup, which might be cannibalism, and plans on entering the county fair next time. And that's Soma Onion. Quite an interesting game. I think I might just prefer the other Soma games in comparison, I know, I know, minority opinion, but this is still pretty funny. Back to Soma Union though. Maybe Torch 60 games in general. This may sound silly, but honestly finding out about Soma Spirits in all of Torch 60's games has kind of been a highlight for me. Especially Soma Spirits and Soma Union. Like yeah, these games had that much of an impact on me. I mean, come on. A game with an underlying message about being manic depressive, and a game about freedom starring a non-binary character? Come on, people, that's me. You know how people talk about their favorite game worlds they'd want to live in? Well, a part of me kind of considers the Torch 60 world to be one of those, which as a game dev, is probably one of the cooler things to hear about your world. It's just an anything goes kind of world with characters of all shapes and sizes. I mean on one hand it would probably suck considering Soma keeps getting destroyed, but you know, maybe that's just the kind of excitement this world needs. Seriously though, I'm glad I found out about these games. And I can't wait to see what's next on Torch 60's Horizon. Who knows, maybe we'll even get that cooler Crusader spin-off game. And I know what you're thinking, Spacey, that tweet is from 2017, stop stalking. And honestly, I was just trying to find out the name of Cardboard Bob, and I didn't feel like skimming through a Summon Spirits playthrough. And well, we actually already know what's next when it comes to Torch 60. It's Epilogue Adventures which looks to be a very fun game, with it being headed by Agent Ape, typically the composer for these games rather than Sergeant M. I'm really curious to explore his vision of game design and see how he handles things. It looks to be very, very interesting. I really want to play through it. And I'm also just ready for all the Torch 60 Universe fan service. So many Union already had a lot of that, but I have a feeling this is going to have a lot more. But until then, I have to say, definitely play Soma Union. It's a fun-filled game with lovable characters, engaging gameplay, and a story that will make you feel a lot of things, and maybe even think about yourself in the world. It did everything it wanted, it did everything I wanted it to do, and more. So, for that, as I look out at the stars, look out at my own horizon, I have one thing to say. Soma Union is perfect. Hey y'all, you know if Soma really means body, does that mean this game is called Body Union? I feel like this is more of a mind union kind of game with how much you explore through those dreams. Also, I know I looked at Soma Onion, or well, Body Onion, dope band name, but that doesn't mean I look at RPG Maker games that primarily focus on default assets, yeah? I want to see the integrity and expression that comes from having your own music and art. And if you don't think you can, well neither could I, but I started doing it and I got better with time. And now I am drawing and making music for my game, regardless of if it's bad or not, I'm satisfied with it. And if I reach that point, then I'm, I think it can be done by anyone. Speaking of my game, 
One of the things that hurts me the most is how often I would bring it up in my reviews and analysis of other games. Like, it actually disgusts me. I never intended for it to seem like I was shoving my game in the audience's face, but that's all it feels like. It's just that I've been working on it for so long that it's nearly always on my mind. But still, I want to apologize to all the game devs who watched my videos of me talking about their game and feel like I'm trying to advertise or distract people from their game with mine. Which is silly, right? Have you seen my game? The only thing distracting about it is how ugly it is. Hey! But yeah, I don't mind talking about it here. This is the end screen after all. So yeah, I'm sorry for that, and I don't often apologize, but this is a legit mistake that has tainted nearly every video I've made thus far. But that's the thing about learning from past mistakes, you learn how to prevent future mistakes. You know, I was also listening to a lot of Van Sire while making this video, to the point where I kind of heavily connect their music to Soma Union. Like I actually kind of picture Zero's voice to be that of the lead singer of Van Sire, it's weird. I guess lastly, I'm hoping none of you all are upset with how emotionless I sound for a lot of this video. I tried to record during a manic phase and quite honestly, I got 50 minutes of audio done and it was mostly just mistakes. For some reason, everything was just moving too fast. I couldn't read the script correctly, at one point even taking a break to wonder what the hell was wrong with me. I'll probably delete the audio. I mean it's great that I was super energized, but something about it and the way I acted and sounded is just too disturbing. Like I couldn't edit it and hear my voice like that. Isn't that so fascinating? But yeah, I'm gonna go now. I'm sure y'all are super tired of my voice. I arguably spawn tired of it. You know where the links are, right? Come on, you always know where they are. I don't need to tell you. Come on, you know. I love y'all. I'm out of here.